This is Thomas Wayne Riley, and you have found yourself in the American Southwest. In the Four Corners region, there are amazing places. Places that are purely Anasazi. Like the Kayenta region of northeastern Arizona, which includes Monument Valley, and the ruins of Navajo National Monument, not far from there. And they're known to us as Betatakan and Kiet Seal. Uh, but also, the Pueblos of Canyon de Che, like White and Antelope House. And that canyon's on the border of New Mexico and Arizona, near the Chuska Mountains, which are visible from that mustard-colored desert. Sleeping Ute Mountain, at the Four Corners. Also, Hovenweep. And the Sand Canyon Pueblos, just above Sleeping Ute. The beautiful ruins of Comb Ridge, like Monarch Cave, which I stumbled upon. And Chaco Canyon itself. I could keep going, but I think you get the picture. And all of these places, all of these modern-day monuments and parks and public lands, all of these mysterious and beautiful ruins, and all of these places, and a whole lot more, the Anasazi left, and they never came back. They never again built pueblos or kivas or any structures of any kind in any of these once jam-packed-with-people areas. Never again. Some researchers argue that they never came back uh, to these once-important places because of truly world-ending climactic events, like, uh, I don't know, the introduction of the other half of the world and its awful diseases, which the people in the New World knew nothing about because they did not domesticate animals like the people in the Old World had and had to live with them for thousands of years, 10,000 years or more. I mean, these diseases from these animals would wipe out 30 to 50 to 75% of some villages or towns in Europe and Asia throughout the, you know, since pretty much... Christ's birth until, not the modern era, but right before we visited the old world. It was almost like we passed them to the old world and and we got rid of them ourselves. Kind of like that movie It Follows. But plagues helped take down the Roman Empire, at least the western half of the Roman Empire, with the many, many iterations of them since about 200 A.D., The Mongols would lob dead bodies filled with the plague over city walls to kill everyone inside so that they could then take the city because their own men were now, by this point, immune to the plagues, which I think if the most recent thing I heard suggests that that plague virus or or disease that attaches itself to fleas and then goes on rats and ships and whatnot, is from the Mongolia, northern China area to begin with. So this disease lands in the New World, unbeknownst to the Europeans who brought it, and it devastates the entire, all three continents from the south to the north, especially those that lived in densely populated areas. So just truly terrible diseases. Lands in the New World, and it devastates 90 or up to 90% of the indigenous populations of the New World. 90%. Some say, uh, myself included, that if it weren't for the Spanish and the later settlers, 
The Anasazi may have gone back, gone back up that Chaka meridian and resettled into those old familiar places, much like their ancestors had. I truly think, just like the Kivas of Chaco were abandoned and later returned to, uh, these places all across the, the Four Corners, they would have, and, and the ruins within the Four Corners, they would have been returned to as well by later generations of Anasazi. Those multi story pueblos and enormous palaces that the Anasazi left behind probably would have been expanded. Uh, upon again and grown even larger with newer innovations and cultural practices that they had adopted down south before coming back up. Craig Childs, one of my favorite authors, says pretty much the same thing uh, when he's talking to an archaeologist and says that the Anasazi were a, quote, civilization on a sliding scale, able to contract or expand at a moment's notice. Abandoning regions for tens or hundreds of years before returning and building again, as if they had never left. The people had a continuity that stretched beyond generations. A coherence of cultural practice surpassing time and place. End quote. But the Anasazi did not return. Alternatively, maybe they would have continued on that uh, Chaco Meridian I'll discuss later as they went even further south. Although, if you follow the Chaco Meridian all the way further south, you'll end up in the Pacific Ocean. But the gist is, maybe the Anasazi would have continued further south all the way until they got to the Aztecs, and maybe clashed with them. I mean, the Aztecs themselves came from further up north. Regardless, the Anasazi never came back. They abandoned their homes in the deserts, cliffs, and canyons of the Four Corners, and left us with the greatest prehistory mystery of the American Southwest, and possibly even the lower 48. Along the spiral migration, some groups or families or clans were flung off, or maybe they voluntarily stepped off the spiral, maybe to look for their own center place. But for whatever reason, the Anasazi leapt up out the southwest and never returned. And as they followed their spiral migration, which, honestly, if you look at a map, the, the way they left Chaco Canyon and then went up and then went over and then went down, and then it kind of resembles a spiral itself. I mean, you've got to kind of plot it out. But it, it's pretty great as they go from Chaco to northern Mexico. Now, what really matters is the spiral represents migration. And so that's why I keep calling it the spiral migration. But as they followed their, their Chaka Meridian spiral migration, the Anasazi upended the entire American Southwest. I mean, they spread, while they were upending the entire region, they spread an overindulgence in corn, they spread T-shaped doors, and they spread an ever always evolving Anasazi style of pottery. And they spread that through every group and secondary city-state and clan and pueblo, whatever the polity was called. Everyone they came across, they spread their core Anasazi tenants. Now, whether they absorbed everyone they encountered or swept them away is totally unknown. But the fact remains that the events I'm about to discuss which, you are being warned, involves man corn, lots of bones, lots of fire, and a, a complete and total abandonment of all areas. It's all 100% true. But the mystery of the Anasazi will hopefully be much less of a mystery once we're done with this series. No more listening to Molder. I love him. Or that one aliens meme dude from the Unhistory channel. Aliens. The Anasazi were real, and in my opinion, an amazing group of people. That, alright, well, despite me hating on those uh, two aforementioned kooks, our, the Anasazi were indeed mysterious. But only because in the end, we don't really know what happened. We don't know what their actual ultimate fate was. 
But we do know where the trail of the Anasazi goes cold. And it ain't in outer space. And where the trail goes cold is where this story will end. But we're a long way from that. In nearly all parts of the Southwest, during the period A.D. 1250 to 1300, we find more evidence for warfare than in any preceding epoch. That's a quote from Plog's 2008 edition of Ancient Peoples of the American Southwest, in a chapter cleverly titled Cliff Dwellings, Cooperation, and Conflict, which is pretty much what this episode is about. Or at least, most of it. The past three episodes, well, actually, I guess the past five episodes, if you include uh, the Mammoth Eaters and the Clovis and Folsom and Ancient Ones and Lunate Crescent Peoples and Basket Makers. and So, basically, the past five episodes have been setting up what I'm going to talk about in this one and the next one and the one after that. Uh, My goal is to explain to y'all, to the best of my knowledge uh, and understanding, what little it is, the history and mystery of the Anasazi. But obviously, the story needed a foundation, so I went back 140,000 years. Uh, Who wouldn't? (laughs) And in the meantime... I whispered over 50,000 words into your ears. If there's one theme you should take away from this series, this entire series, the, the series over the people that have inhabited the American Southwest for the last 15,000 years or more, it's migration. Both immense and small. That spiral that that migration spiral has been a centerpiece of the last few episodes since I mentioned Masau and the center place. But even the mammoth eaters sprinted across the nation. The ancient ones abandoned the Southwest completely during the uh, completely naturally occurring Altai Thermal. And then once that totally warmer than it is now period of the Altai Thermal ended, the people of the Southwest returned as soon as it got cooler. And then those that returned after the Altai Thermal, they never stayed put either. The six toes and sandals pecked and painted all over the Southwest remain as testaments to migration itself. And then pueblos and palaces and roads. I mean, they built roads. Roads are the ultimate symbol of movement that you could put on a landscape. It, it represents a movement of people or goods or animals or, I mean, nowadays cars, back and forth. It's, an, it's, a, it's the ultimate symbol of movement, unless you count the spiral or both combined. I mean, the people of the Southwest, they loved their movement. They had the spirals, and they had the giant monumental roads. But the Anasazi and the people of the Southwest, sticking with that theme of migration, they even left those roads. They left them. There were migrations and return migrations and then migrations again. The people of the Southwest, they were constantly turning. The people of the Southwest, they seemingly never stopped moving. Well, I mean, at least until the 20th century, when Uncle Sam forced them to stay on reservations at gunpoint, or with the threat of starvation, of course. Uh, But that spiral migration has been a focus of these episodes, and that migration truly ramps up at this time in our story. So we left off uh, in our story with Chaco being abandoned, and Aztec and Solomon. Solomon is the name of the a family who owned the land. So it's not salmon. I know how to say salmon. It's Solomon. So Aztec and Solomon are near exact replicas of that monumental canyon, and they are about to share the same fate as Chaco did. So let's continue from that point, that point on the Chaco Meridian, and let's follow the spiral. But first, what is this Chaco Meridian I keep talking about? Uh, I know I've mentioned it multiple times now, 
and it is an extremely interesting and important Anasazi cultural fact. Although I guess it's more of a theory, really. The theory of the Chaka Meridian comes from, to borrow a phrase from a rather famous podcaster, the great and powerful Stephen Lexon. Uh, I have used Stephen Lexon extensively uh, in the last episode, and I will again in this episode. And that is because he is probably the most knowledgeable person on Earth when it comes to Chaco Canyon, in my opinion, and a few other um, talented and educated people. Uh, Craig Childs, a favorite author of mine who I also quoted extensively in the last one, and the one before that, and the one before that, and I will in the next one, and then this one, and uh, the one after that, if there is one, which I believe there is. So Craig Childs, in his book, House of Rain, which he actually wrote to explain the disappearance of the Anasazi in the, in the first place. And in that book, he practically walks on foot, because the man is crazy, but in a good way. But he walks on foot, I mean, not the entirety, not the whole thing, but he walks on foot in the summer and the winter, every season, from Chaco up to Mesa Verde through Aztec. Uh, he walks over to the Bears Ears, down the Mogollon Rim, across the Tortilla Curtain, that is the Mexican border, and he gets to the Sierra Madres in Mexico. And that's where our story, and his, in House of Rain, and actually the Anasazis, will end as well. So, Craig Childs has uh, this to say about the great and powerful archaeologist, uh, thinker, writer, and scholar, that is Lexan. Quote, Everyone in Southwest archaeology has something to say about Lexan. He has stirred up academic dissent and discussion as far away as Central America, where archaeologists previously paid very little attention to what was happening in the American Southwest, a far and dusty corner of the world. End quote. Childs goes on to further say that people squirm when his name is mentioned in conversations, and that uh, Childs has, quote, learned to use Lexan's name with care when speaking among archaeologists, end quote. Those archaeologists are a finicky, funny bunch. Uh, so you know Lexan's got some, some pretty good ideas if he's making the establishment uneasy. Uneasy in a good way, not just a provocative way. And you know I have got some good respect for people who can make the establishment uneasy. Again, in a good way, not, not just to do it. But he does have some great ideas as a I discussed extensively in the last episode with his, and what, what were they, fun and true facts about, take him to the bank, true facts about Chaco. Anyways, I'll let uh, Craig Child's summation of Lexan's Chaco Meridian explain the fantastic theory. If you drew a line north out of Chaco, you would hit Aztec, New Mexico, home of Chaco's immediate architectural progeny. Uh, back in the 12th century. If you took that same line 400 miles due south, you would end up smack in the middle of Pakime in the 13th and 14th centuries. This 400-mile line is so accurate that even modern surveyors would be hard-pressed to repeat it. Coincidence? Alexan asked. I don't think so. End quote. 500 years before Chaco, or even more than that, but at least since 500 AD, the most impressive sites of each archaeological period in the southwest is on that north-south line, that Chaco Meridian. You should honestly look at a map right now. Line it up. Open up your Maps app. Take Aztec, New Mexico. Go down to a place called Nuevo Casas Grandes in northern Mexico in the state of Chihuahua. And it is a straight line. Uh, that line will also include Chaco Canyon and many other amazing, important sites to the Anasazi. Uh, Lexan even suggests there might be sites every 20 miles on the Chaco Meridian. North of Chaco and just south of Durango, Colorado, is a place formerly known as Sacred Ridge, but is now called the Animus La Plata Project. Because archaeologists, maybe except for Lexan and Christy Turner of Mancorn, and a few others, they're not quite as imaginative as, as maybe writers 
But in this area, known as Animus La Plata Project, or ALP for short, an enormous, at least for the time, community grew out of the land as a possible precursor to Chaco. There's even monumental architecture in the 8th century. Here's Lexan in his follow-up article um, after he released his book, The Chaco Meridian, which kind of talks about all this. In that follow-up article titled Amending the Meridian, Lexan says he was, quote, immensely impressed by the size and complexity of the pit house sites, which dated to the 8th century AD. There was nothing in the ALP area immediately before the 8th century, and nothing after. It was a big, but short-lived, bang. A further tour of the eight-mile-wide swath of the project convinced Lexan that there were more 8th century sites than in any other area in the northern southwest. It was a continuous blur of houses and villages. ALP excavators found things on Sacred Ridge that no one had ever seen at 8th century sites, such as the 10-foot-wide base of a two-story tower. Nobody built towers in the 8th century, end quote. He also discusses a site known as Shibikashi, which was in Chaco Canyon in the 500s. It was a large site for its time with about 80 houses and a great kiva, of course. I mentioned Shibikashi because, well, first of all, it's fun to say, but I mentioned Shibikashi because it supports Lexan's meridian theory. At the end of that previously mentioned article of his, the amendment to the meridian, he says this of the incredible, if true, line of Anasazi settlements. Shibikashi, Sacred Ridge, Chaco, Aztec, and Pakime. Five unique points in a line, each the biggest and most important site of its respective era. The chances of that happening by accident are minuscule. There has to be history, human decisions, and human intentions behind the meridian. So, for seven centuries, the center of the Pueblo world bounced back and forth over only 80 miles, from Chaco Canyon to Sacred Ridge and back again, and then to Aztec ruins. The southern extension to Pakime is still a matter of doubt and debate, I admit. But the new data from Shibikashi and the ALP complex give me some confidence that the Chaco Meridian was real and that it meant something to the ancient Pueblo people. What exactly did it mean? I don't know yet. Since that article's release, the strength of evidence for Pakime being an Anasazi site has definitely grown immensely. I think Lexan is brilliant. And he's absolutely on to something, and I'm not the only one that thinks that. Besides, that straight line of settlements would not have been ignored by people who built straight roads and other monumental architectural features that aligned with the stars and cardinal directions. The Chaco and Anasazi, or ancient ones, or ancestral Puebloans, whatever you would like to call them, the Anasazi were everywhere by 1200. I know I mentioned last time that they were filling every nook and cranny and canyon and cliffside and mesa top, all the valleys, everywhere of the southwestern Four Corners region. And everywhere they went, they brought their kivas. And those kivas are seriously everywhere in the southwest. Uh, It only takes one walk through a Four Corners canyon to come up on a collapsed or nearly collapsed kiva surrounded by potsherds and old wood that if you matched the tree ring data to the data set, you would find out exactly when that kiva was built. The Anasazi are also expanding their great house outliers. They're putting them onto far-flung landscapes and territories, and they're spreading their ceramics and their T-shaped doors. And with those, their large Pueblo mini palaces, the great houses with them. Some of these new Pueblos were D-shaped replicas of those distant uh, but not forgotten Chaco Canyon great houses, except some of these D-shaped pueblos were built in very defensive locations uh, with defensive positions in mind. Yet some of the other uh, D-shaped replicas, the newer settlements, were adhering to the old ceremonial placing. Uh, As a matter of fact, at this time, some of the pueblos were being built with the beloved southwestern style of uh, uh, south-facing communities with kivas in the front, while Totally other new ones, 
were being built with the land's uh, topography and geography in mind and the feeling of, well, to me, I get the feeling that they were put that way for defensive purposes. So the reason the staple of Southwestern building for the Anasazi and the Pueblo era was south facing is because that means during the winter you get more sun and during the summer you get in turn less of it, which means it's cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. And if you've been to the Four Corners area, you know it's hot in the summer and it is freaking cold in the winter. So this difference um, in style that we're seeing, that our researchers are seeing, most likely means there were two different factions or maybe cultures by this point. And they were both operating at the same time in the same space, or at least very nearby each other. One group seemed to be living in comfort and possible peace, while the other in defense and fear. As I've mentioned, it appears a division occurred in Chaco. A division that may have led to the Chaco and then the Aztec and Mesa Verde split, which we will talk about extensively. But that division is also mirrored outside of the canyon in the copycat great houses and Pueblo communities, the D-shaped ones that are popping up all over the land. Even that extremely peculiar and exciting architectural feature, the Anasazi Tower, begins to pop up in the defensible position communities, mostly those, not really in the older ones that were being built on ceremonial lines, and more on those towers to come. But when we're talking about the population growth and enormous increase in settlements, there is a great example of this, uh, of this typical pattern for the southwestern Four Corners region at this time, in an amazing group of ruins that are located in an alcove overhang, a massive alcove, alcove overhang, uh, in northern Arizona, at a place called Navajo National Monument. I know I've mentioned it before, uh, even in the beginning of this episode, when I was listing off all of the places the Aztecs had, uh, or have still, uh, beautiful ruins. The name, Navajo National Monument, is confusing, because the Navajo have nothing to do with the ruins. Although, we'll get into it later, but that may not be true. Well, well yeah, we'll just get into it later. But it's it's called Navajo National Monument because, like so many of the other ruins, they reside on Navajo land. This huge alcove-inhabiting town is known to us as Betatakin. I've seen Betatakin. Not up close, mind you, because of the many great restrictions the parks put on public lands. But I've seen them from, from a distance, where there's a great viewpoint. I mean, it really is a great viewpoint. Uh, when you look down at it from this viewpoint, it's, kind of, it's pretty far away, and it almost looks like it's not real. It kind of looks like it's a, a miniature set. The mini pictures I took will be on the website, as will pictures of almost all the ruins I'll be talking about, because I have been there. I have seen them. This place, Betatakin, it is amazing. It looks almost untouched since the people left. But the population growth appears like this. The site began in 1267. We know that by the tree ring dates. So in 1267, they built three clusters of rooms. And in those rooms, there are living rooms, storage rooms, a courtyard, and sometimes a kitchen where the corn and beans were ground for consumption. So there's three of these clusters or apartments built immediately in 1267. And one more apartment built uh, the following year in 1268. Then in 1275, what is that, seven years later, a significant amount of people moved in and 10 more apartments were built by 1277. Along with the new apartments came uh, new ceramics and probably other new cultural artifacts which have not survived to this day. Unfortunately for archaeologists, not a lot survives. For the next nine years of occupation, a few more apartments were added as new families moved in. What's very curious, though, is the fact that the initial people that arrived in 1267, they seemed to have known that more families would be arriving at a later date, because when they built those newer apartments, uh, it was with wood they'd cut, back, they'd cut down way back in 67, and they'd stockpiled it for that very purpose of building apartments when more people came, which suggests this whole settlement seems to have been a planned community. Yet just 
six miles away down the same canyon is another settlement, Kiet Seal. And I've never been to Kiet Seal, although I think it's a great hike, and I will do it one day. You just, I just have to go during the open season, which I don't often go to the Four Corners area in open season. I go in like March or April when there's not a lot of people, and the temperature's usually great because it's not too hot, and it can get cold, but it's not too bad. But anyways, uh, Kiet Seal, it began in the 1240s, and it grew quite large, but rather haphazardly. Um, each new group that came, when they arrived, they just kind of added on to it. As we'll soon talk about extensively, the all-important date to define the region of this Four Corners area, the Anasazi region, is the year 1300. And by that date, both Betatakan and Kietzil are abandoned, along with everywhere else. That means Betatakan, one of the most magnificently planned communities of the Anasazi, was only occupied for maybe 20 years. Not quite even a generation. But regarding families moving into the area, Plog points out that the Hopi have an oral tradition that states that the addition of entire clans or tribes that had migrated from quite far off sometimes, well, that adoption, that adding into the clan of entirely other clans, it happened a lot historically. That's if and the newcomers could bring something useful to the tribe. Like rain. Maybe that's what was happening here. There's evidence that some peoples traveled, taking their pottery with them and other important uh, cultural aspects over 200 miles. Sometimes they traveled peacefully, other times not so peacefully, as we'll see. This traveling to resettle with others is definitely a defining characteristic of this time period before the Great Drought, which starts in 1277 and then the year of the Great Divide migration of 1300. Everything's coming together, or everyone's coming together, they're all building, and then everyone just leaves. Before the Great Abandonment, though, regional ceramic differences become strikingly distinct, especially as the 1200s progresses. Uh, Localized trade, which probably helped bolster this regional variation, it became even more important. The people seemed to have been coming together only to separate themselves from other areas, like, say, Mesa Verde versus Bears Ears versus the Cayenta region of northern Arizona versus Aztec and Salmon, which they didn't even seem to agree either. All of these different regional variations, they become quite clear in the archaeological record. Not only did the villages become larger during this time of expansion, massive expansion, but their serving vessels were increasing in size as well, by a lot, a whole lot. This may seem somewhat insignificant, But it just goes to show you that more people were being fed at the same time in a group setting. How truly the people were coming together like they'd never done before in the Southwest. And one spot that the coming together seemed to elevate itself over all the others, literally elevate itself and figuratively, was a place in southern Colorado. More specifically, Mesa Verde. Uh, Mesa Verde seemed straightforward to me at first um, when I was doing my research. It was an incredibly well-defended and well-built and well-represented area of the Ancient One's world. And it still captures the imagination of visitors worldwide today. Now, I admit I've only been there twice, and both times were in the off-season, so all I could do was marvel at the structures and its beauty, and its dark, mysterious corners, and oh, it really is so pretty. But all I could do was stare at it from the wonderful but oh-so-far-away vantage point that the, the Park Service created. But then, during the research, the deeper I went and the, and the more I read, the blurrier the picture became of Mesa Verde, until it all just sort of clicked. Of course, my sources are incredibly brilliant and talented, and they're amazing individuals, and I cannot pretend to have ever thought of or entertained the ideas um, that I have written down and I'm going to share with you. I could not have done them without reading their works and receiving their help, the proverbial help. Y- you know, as always, this episode and everything I do is usually always, no, not usually, it's always based off of much more talented and experienced researchers, archaeologists, anthropologists, historians, and even adventurers than I am. But everything 
I am saying, although it could be proven wrong in the future, at least the part I'm going to be speculating on, but the rest of it, it's true, at least for now. But Mesa Verde, where do I even start? Uh, first of all, uh, I guess I can start by telling you that a civil war is about to rock the Anasazi world. It will be brutal and violent, and you're going to hear all about it shortly. Uh, but to set up this civil war, I've got to mention this very important place that is Mesa Verde. So it, it sits on the New Mexican Colorado border, south of the towering and imposing and often white tipped Rockies. And from Mesa Verde's high vantage point, you can seemingly see all the way down into the Chacoan world, all the way down almost into that canyon itself. You can't, but it feels like you can. And I kind of think that the Mesa Verde Anasazi would have felt the same way. And there's a quick tangent I gotta, I gotta say while I'm actually recording. This isn't even written down really, but some people believe that Mesa, or actually Chaco Canyon started with Mesa Verde. I, I believe that it started with the Southerners that came up and helped the Mesa Verde build Chaco Canyon. But they say that the leader of Chaco Canyon wasn't at Pueblo Benito, but it was at Pueblo Alto on top. And to me, if that's true, it kind of signifies, like, it kind of symbolizes Pueblo Alto, Mesa Verde. As in, Mesa Verde sits above all of the Chacoan landscape on, on Mesa Verde, uh, high above the, um, oh shoot, the San Juan Basin. And so Chaco mirrors almost the Anasazi world by Pueblo Alto being above the canyon and all the other great houses would have come to it. And maybe that's that was a prerequisite for the Southerners and the Mesa Verde and people to come together to build Chaco. I have no idea absolutely no idea if that is true, but I'm going to leave it in because it sounds pretty good, actually. And as we will talk about, I mean, the Southerners, the, the people who built Chaco from the South, who came from the South, they did have to, they had to have struck an agreement with the Northerners who were already there. And maybe that agreement was the Mesa Verde and sit up top. I don't know. The more I think about it, actually, the more it makes sense. So not to jump ahead and, and ruin it, but the Civil War will be against Mesa Verde. Well, in my opinion, will be against the Mesa Verde Anasazi versus the Southerner Anasazi. So, hey, spoiler alert. Uh, back to uh, Mesa Verde, though. I, I, we're still talking about Mesa Verde, but back to Mesa Verde. Plog also has a great quote about Mesa Verde and how awe-inspiring it is. Uh, he says, quote, Nowhere else in the Southwest can a visitor gain such a vivid impression of what life would have been like in the 13th century, from the smoke filtering out of Kiva entryways, to the cries of infants resonating against rock shelter walls, to the appearance of the cliff dwellers themselves. End quote. He is not wrong. It's an incredible place, and an incredibly well-preserved place, and an incredibly well-defensible place. Starting in the 1080s, Chaco appears to have sent intruders to Mesa Verde settlements on the tops of the Mesa in the form of uh, maybe priests or missionaries or emissaries, maybe evil tax collectors or warriors or even princely leaders themselves. Who knows? But those first intrusions would eventually turn Mesa Verde into a sort of major outpost for the Chaco Canyon secondary state. Now, it's also possible that maybe Chaco didn't send anyone up to Mesa Verde, but Mesa Verde requested some representation down in Chaco. I read both of those interpretations of how Mesa Verde gained prestige, but as I just mentioned a moment ago, what I truly believe is that Chaco was actually established by ancient ones who called their home Mesa Verde before going down into the mustard-colored canyon to join with the Southerners to build that magnificent secondary state and all its monumental architecture. Uh, during those early years of the 1080s, though, most of the Anasazi settlements, not only of Mesa Verde, but also of Bears Ears, and other surrounding areas up north as well, were situated on the tops of mesas. But once Chaco Aztec began to collapse in the early 1200s and the split between great houses spread throughout the countryside and this civil war that I just uh, earlier mentioned began, the villages left the flat open defenseless tops of mesas and valleys and moved into the canyons where the Chacoan refugees brought their old 
ways. And where we still hike and adventure out to sea today. I mean, those canyon cliff-dwelling ruins, that's what makes the Anasazi Four Corners region famous. That's what I travel to way too often, and what all these adventure writers that I read travel to all the time. It defines the region's archaeology for outsiders. I believe it is here, on Mesa Verde, that a faction of Chacoan elites, I'll call them the home team, moved into the canyons of the Mesa and built a fortress. A fortress that must have seemed impenetrable to outsiders. As the home team Mesa Verde elites moved up there to build a rebel stronghold, the Mesa began acting like a magnet. A magnet that stole people, resources, and plenty of ideas. And it stole them right up until the abandonment of 1300, which is a concept we will discuss uh, very shortly. Child says of Mesa Verde, quote, Century-old great houses became cores of residential settlements as they were overcome by waves of incoming migrants, end quote. And these rebel migrants, they became isolated from the outside world on top of these mesas. As pottery trade slowed with the people still remaining in the south, the people they were probably actively warring against, shells from the distant sea stopped showing up in high numbers, and macaws disappeared altogether. Obviously, this rebel outpost had wandered far from the pure faith of Chaco Aztec, and pretty far from the good graces of its uh, heart-carving leaders. Pottery trade with the southern Anasazi slowed, yes, but pottery creation did not, and on Mesa Verde a completely distinct style took shape and would eventually spread rapidly through the Four Corners. This tells me uh, that the spreading rapidly throughout the Four Corners that the Mesa Verde home team was rather popular with the neighbors. And yeah, while many people fled to the outskirts of the Anasazi world, well, to mainly avoid the coming violence and the violence that had defined the region, which we'll hear about, but the people as they spread outward, they still shared an identity with this side of the Civil War, the Mesa Verde side. Along with the new ceramics, also came a new floor plan for the settlements in the Mesa Canyons. This floor plan appears to be based on the social engineering of keeping once distantly populated families and groups separate while they were being forced at the same time to become close neighbors. They were close neighbors either once again or maybe for the first time. And they were close neighbors with people they'd rather either not be near or at the very least they were leery of becoming completely incorporated into. An uneasy, as these always are, separate but equal situations seem to be emerging at uh, Mesa Verde. I uh, interpret this as being, and I guess I've kind of hinted at it, but at the creation of Chaco, uh, when it first began, Uh, Mesa Verde elites, or maybe a family, or maybe a clan, or multiple clans, maybe they went down south to the mustard-colored canyon and helped build that secondary state with those southerners from Mesoamerica. They helped build it before going back up to Mesa Verde to ask their old friends and family for taxes or wives or warriors or tribute or what have you. Maybe the Mesa Verde and elite living in Chaco called upon their old homeland friends to chip in. And by doing so, uh, calling on these, these other clans, maybe that elevated some members of the Mesa Verde society by the sheer fact of them being affiliated with that Alta pedal that was uh, down south. But eventually, Chaco falls apart, as we will hear about. And when it did... The Mesa Verde elites fled what was now the capital at Aztec and went back home to Mesa Verde. And when they got there, a leery population of elites somewhat welcomed the old timers. Um, But these old timers who were coming back and had such power at Chaco would now be exerting probably an unwanted amount of influence on, on the people of Mesa Verde. But since they were from the same clan or family, or at least since they shared uh, common ancestors, this new group of Mesa Verde elites, um, who only became Mesa Verde elites uh, 
by being aligned with Chaco Mesa Verde and elites in the first place, well, these new Mesa Verde elites, they let in the old guys, begrudgingly, probably. And once there on top of the Mesa, well, actually now in the canyons of, of Mesa Verde, the two rejoined sides would form what I call the home team faction of the Civil War. And they would build impenetrable defenses that would not see violence on the Mesa itself. Uh, there is no archaeological evidence for violence during this period on the Mesa or in the canyons. There is little evidence for warfare. So I guess there's, there, there's a very small, but it's mostly defensive. Some archaeologists suggest this lack of evidence of warfare is because the warfare element is, is overplayed and too hyped. And these places were probably just sacred Anasazi areas. While I myself, and now you guys, know the Anasazi practice sacred architecture, I believe the lack of evidence for warfare on Mesa Verde and in the canyons means the embattlements and the fortress, they were extremely successful at their job of keeping people out. It's also on Mesa Verde where the very famous and spectacular and very defensible cliffside ruins known as Cliff Palace were built and occupied. And they were built and, and occupied in pretty much a 20-year period between 1260 and 1280, which was the height of the Civil War. Cliff Palace is truly the jewel of Mesa Verde and one of the jewels of the Anasazi world in general. It is truly a remarkable place, and its name is so very fitting, Cliff Palace. Enter Richard Wetherill. Richard Wetherill is a monumentally important and controversial figure in Southwestern and, well, especially Anasazi and Ancestral Puebloan archaeology. Now, in the future, he and his brothers and nephews and children and his whole family will definitely have their own episode because they lived incredibly fascinating and pretty remarkable lives. And they lived and they did all this stuff in my favorite place in the whole world. And their story is truly incredible. One of the Mesa fingers uh, of Mesa Verde is called Weatherill Mesa. And way back in 2017, when I visited Mesa Verde, uh, that was the first time I saw the name Weatherill. Uh, okay, but now that I'm recording this, I realize that Plog does mention Weatherill, and I was supposed to have read Plog's 2008 book when I was in college. So it is not the first time I have seen the significance of Weatherill. It's just the first time I remembered it. Although there is a good possibility that I did not read that entire book when I was in college. So I reckon the second time that I saw Weather Reel, but the first time I really remembered it or understood its significance was this summer, in the summer of 22, when I read Barillo's Behind the Bears Ears. I read that for this series. It was helpful, although I didn't quite agree. I don't quite agree with everything Barillo says, um, especially, it turns out, when it comes to Richard Weather Reel. Barillo talks about Richard Wetherill and his family extremely unfavorably. I assumed because of that reading that the dude sucked and that he must have been responsible for destroying so much cultural heritage and so many artifacts because he just pot hunted around the Southwest. There's even rumors that he used dynamite. Uh, but that couldn't be further from reality. And thankfully, one of my new favorite authors, David Roberts, in both his books, In Search of the Old Ones and The Lost World of the Old Ones, two different books, he paints uh, Wetherill and his family in a much more forgiving and favorable and honestly truthful light. It was refreshing every time Roberts brought up Wetherill, or at least Richard, or his family. I mean, again, I will do an episode. Uh, maybe a mini episode, but I will do an episode on the Weatherill family. Uh, maybe I'll put it behind a paywall or something because you know I got bills to pay. But uh, you will love hearing their story. Seriously. <laughs> 
In the history of the Southwest, no scholar ever found or discovered more sites, or more important sites, than Richard Wetherill. That quote from Roberts sums up Richard pretty well. Not only was Richard Wetherill, who was just a Quaker rancher, but not only was he the first to correlate depth in the soil with the age of the artifact, he coined the term basket maker. He coined it in relation to uh, the ancient ones that made the baskets uh, before they made ceramics. He also learned to speak Ute and Navajo. Do you know how hard of a language Navajo is? Well, I'll tell you all about it next year on my Navajo series, so stay tuned. Yeah, okay, Richard carted out everything from pots to skulls, everything that he found, but he donated dang near all of it, everything, to universities and museums. He didn't make pretty pennies selling stuff to, to random Easterners. Actual archaeologists at that time that he was digging this stuff up in the 1880s to the 1900s, actual archaeologists, they weren't much better, and their methods were sometimes even worse. And unlike all them archaeologists, Richard later admitted to essentially being a pot hunter, but with good intentions. In the 20th and especially 21st century, he became so hated that his initials uh, or name, which he would carve on cave walls or boulders near sites, not he wouldn't deface sites, but he would carve his name like so many old Spanish and Anglo and Mexican. And you know what? Even ancestral Puebloans and Navajo, they would carve their names or symbols or clans onto rocks near sites. Not so much the Navajo. They wouldn't go near sites because they believed that they were filled with ghosts, but that's not important. What's important right now is that in the 21st century and the 20th century, modern archaeologists, grad students, and park rangers would, when they saw his initials or name, would destroy it. They would vandalize actual archaeology by thinking that they were preserving older archaeology. They would wipe his name out. They would rub it out. They would paint over it. They would chip it out of the wall. Richard Wetherill would eventually move to Chaco Canyon, where he would set up a trading post. Um, but he would only set up a trading post after years and years and years, decades, exploring the Southwest. He was sometimes the first person to enter canyons, slot canyons, mesas, areas. He was the first white person, Spaniard or Anglo, period, since the Anasazi had been there. But eventually, he opened a trading post in Chaco Canyon, but only because he was literally forced to by the courts. He was no longer allowed to excavate any more sites. After all of his hard work, everything that he found and donated, he was cut off from what he truly loved doing. And the ones who started this inquiry into his doings that forced him to stop, they were just jealous of him. And they were archaeologists and Eastern professors. And they did a much worse job of preserving the artifacts that they found than he ever did. His story is kind of tragic, but exciting, and I'm definitely going to tell it. Uh, David Roberts also says this of Richard, quote, Wetherill's Grand Gulch work. Uh, Grand Gulch is an immense area of canyons on Cedar Mesa, by the way. Wetherill's Grand Gulch work had a substantial influence on the development of southwestern archaeology. Also apparent is his empathy with the Anasazi. Not only had he spent years probing their buried secrets, but he, too, had lived most of his days directly on the land. He, too, knew how it felt to see his crops wither and fail, or to slip on a high ledge and catch himself just in time. He had what we would now call a feel. For the pattern of Anasazi life. End quote. There's so much more to, to Richard and his family, and I will go into them, like I said, in a different episode. And I'm excited for that one. Wetherill, upon finding the magnificent ruins on Mesa Verde, named the most famous one Cliff Palace, which is exactly what it is. The place is astoundingly impressive. <laughs> 
It's got 220 masonry rooms and 23 kivas. 23 kivas means a lot of families were coming together. Before the Park Service eased entry with uh, ramps and handrails, re- eased entry onto Cliff Palace, onto the ledge where Cliff Palace sits, before they put ramps and handrails, the only way to get there was by climbing. Climbing by using hand and toe holds carved into the sandstone cliffside by the Anasazi themselves. Because of this very hard to reach access, and it's tough to spot from both the mesa top and the canyon floor, because of this, the preservation is so great at Cliff Palace that some of the structures still have original roofs, and they even have paintings on the walls, original paint. Basketry and textiles, clothing, have been found in excellent condition, and even turkey droppings have been found still lying in the pens that hold, or at least held, those probably sacred birds. Beyond Cliff Palace, there's multiple other alcove ruins scattered around the mesa, like Balcony House, Spruce Tree House, Step House, Long House, Square Tower House, and 600 other cliff dwellings. It was, actually, the most rooms per square mile in the entire Southwest. And it was actually more populated then than it is now. Inside some of these uh, dwellings, cliff dwellings, ceramic mugs have been found hanging on pegs, untouched since last place there some 800 years ago. There are also walls and structures built around natural springs that pour out of the mesa, and the people of Mesa Verde built lots of dams, and they diverted lots of that precious, precious water. Trails between communities exist from that era. Fields were communally grown, and defenses were manned, probably not and day, at least during this later occupation of the Civil War. Were these structures on Mesa Verde, were they built by the Rebel Home Team and the countless others throughout the region, especially in places like southeastern Utah and on uh, Cedar Mesa? Were they built for defense? An old-timer archaeologist uh, from Sweden named Nordenskiold, he certainly seemed to think so. Nordenskiold uh, actually wrote the very first scholarly monograph ever written. He wrote the very first one about the Anasazi in his 1893, The Cliff Dwellers of the Mesa Verde. And that was published in Stockholm. And I agree with the eventually run out of the the Southwest for being a foreigner, of course. I agree with the old timer. I have been to many an Anasazi ruin, more than I can count, honestly. And some of them seem to be incapable of of being anything other than being built in a defensive position. At this time uh, in the story, the 1200s, the Civil War is raging. In the area below Mesa Verde, uh, the lowlands, uh, the San Juan Basin, this lowlands, which would have been allied with the Mesa Verde faction, in that area, far too many charred bodies and sacked villages have been uncovered. Santa Fe-based archaeologist Eric Blinman put it perfectly when he told David Roberts, quote, In the 1280s, around Mesa Verde, a lot of people were killed. The society was decimated. End quote. It seems the war began to take on a scorched earth policy. Not far from Mesa Verde, built by those same Mesa Verde Anasazi, or at least... Cousins, is a place known as Yellow Jacket Pueblo, which actually has the highest density of ceremonial structures ever found in the Southwest. Of those ceremonial structures are 182 kivas, a great kiva, 17 Anasazi towers, and a great tower. Although construction of Yellow Jacket Pueblo began by at least 8950, the place was continuously occupied well, at least until every other place in the Southwest was abandoned by the Anasazi in that all-important year of 1300. 
Certain parts of the Pueblo were three stories tall. And it has been suggested that it was a communal area where people from across the region gathered, which is backed up by the sheer number of kivas at the site. 182 kivas is a lot of families. According to David Pereternitz, a professor emeritus at the University of Colorado, Yellow Jacket is the, quote, key to understanding the final Anasazi occupation of the area and how it relates to other sites of the period, end quote. By this, I think he's referring to the fact that within every single one of the kivas, within the so-called Great Tower Complex, so not all of the kivas, but all of the kivas in this Great Tower Complex, within the kivas is what's known as the ventilator tunnels, and in those ventilator tunnels, approximately two feet deep into them, were found an axe. The Crow Canyon Archaeological Center uh, said in their write-up about these axes that, uh, quote, they may have been kept in readiness to meet a possible invader, and, if viewed in this light, may be a possible clue to the reason for the abandonment of the dwelling. End quote. The study later goes on to say, quote, The construction of this block around a spring and the compact architectural style of the block suggests defensive protection of a key water source. Thus, there are signs of competition for resources during the time the Great Tower Complex was occupied and possible hints of conflict, as had been documented at other sites occupied in the late 1200s. End quote. I don't think you hide a devastating weapon in your living room or meeting house unless you plan to use it, or feel like you may have to one day. It's also probably significant that they were found in the kivas at the Great Tower Complex. I have continuously mentioned these towers. So what the heck are they? When I think of towers, I think of the medieval towers my wife and I got dizzy climbing up and down in France as we spiraled skyward past arrow slots towards a top platform that lets one see great distances. Well, that's exactly what the Anasazi towers were as well, I think. The towers appear to be the last archaeological feature built by the Anasazis in the Four Corners region, and they seem to be defensive in nature built to look over crops and fields in this period of the late 1200s, this violent period. A lot of them have T-shaped doors, signifying possible ceremonial use, and some are connected to kivas. Others have tunnels beneath them which lead to nearby kivas. But many of these towers show signs of warfare. Warfare and burning and death, with one tower excavation revealing 30 infants who'd been burned alive. Another tower nearby on the Colorado-Utah line has been found holding the remains of 11 adults and 3 infants. And in the doorway were the skulls of 2 infants. Only the skulls. One was still complete with blood-matted hair. After all of these years, the hair and stains of death had remained on the bodiless skull of the child that had been placed in the T-shaped doorway of that Anasazi tower. But to briefly get away from the, the violence and death, the most beautiful tower I've seen is in Hovenweep, which is on the border of Colorado and Utah, on the Utah side. It has a great view of Sleeping Ute Mountain and beautiful sunsets, and it's normally pretty empty. And I'm not popular enough to spread the word that it's normally pretty empty, and I hope it stays that way. But beyond Hovenweep, I've seen and peered carefully into a lot of other towers on Cedar Mesa and the surrounding areas. I've seen them square, and I've seen them round. I've seen them in canyons, on boulders, in caves, and in alcoves. I've seen them on the top of canyon rims, too. But the most fascinating tower is that square tower at Hovenweep which is built inside the canyon uh, on top of a boulder where it seems it serves no purpose. Hovenweep has all of these structures on the can on the, the small canyon rim. It's not a huge canyon, it's a small canyon, but there are all these structures on the canyon rim and there are some structures built inside of cracked boulders within the canyon which is which are very cool to see as well. But this tower doesn't say it doesn't sit on top of the rim overlooking all of the ruins. It sits within the canyon where it seemingly has no purpose. Yet, a lot of the other towers I have seen seem to be constructed in a way that would have made them seen from great distances, and they are clearly defensive. 
or at least a warning of what you'll face if you come for a fight. But ultimately, the towers didn't keep out the invaders. In the end, before the mass migration out of the region, these Anasazi towers may have been a false hope, a last-ditch effort at stopping the spiral. At the start of the Civil War, when the Anasazi were spreading out everywhere, from Mesa Verde to all the other regions I've discussed, one of them, one of these places, in before the Great Divide of 1300 and that mass migration, one of these places is one of my favorite places on the whole planet. It's Canyonlands National Park. And, you know, I always give the National Park Service a bunch of crap, and I will probably do an episode on how I would fix the park system, because I have a way to fix the park system. But I really do love the parks, and I love what the park system does. I just don't love how they do it necessarily. But the parks and the park system is fantastic and necessary, especially for our country. And we kind of set the bar in the whole world for that. So I am proud of our park system, even though I could fix it. But anyways, back to the story. In Canyonlands National Park and the surrounding area of the Abajo Mountains, the La Salle Mountains, uh, Needles, Islands in the Sky, Cedar Mesa, all of them, all of these places became hiding spots for desperate people, desperate Anasazi, to live in as they fled the violence of the Chaco Corps world as it broke apart in a civil war. Quick side note about the La Salle Mountains. I don't know if you've been to Moab or the area, but the La Salle Mountains, when the Spanish arrived, it was hot, it was summer, it was scorching, and they saw the white-covered, snow-white-covered mountains of the La Salles, and they assumed that there was no way in that hot, scorching desert of the canyons, of the Red Canyons in the Colorado River, that those mountains could have snow on their tops. So, they assumed that they were giant piles of salt, or in Spanish, sal, La Salle. So, La Salles in Moab, it means salt mountains, but really it's just because the Spanish could not believe. And if you've been there in the summertime, you'd also not believe that there could be snow up in them there mountains. But there is. Quick side note, done. As the Spanish found out, and as I have also found out, the Canyonlands area is a hot one in the summer and a cold one in the winter. And it is a steep place, and it is a rocky and a dangerous place. And many skeletons that have been recovered and excavated from that area of the Canyonlands and many of the other Canyon areas in the Southwest Anasazi world, many of those skeletons show signs of repeated breakage and healing from long falls. Legs, arms, even hips, they've all been recovered with signs of multiple breaks consistent with falling. It only takes one slip of the sandal or your bare foot and you're over the edge. Now, sometimes you're seven feet off the deck, and sometimes you're 700. Uh, One article I read for this episode, uh, The Oklahoman, actually, uh, it attempted, this article attempted some humor when the author suggested that the Anasazi built their dwellings on cliffs because they were trying to weed out the klutzes from their gene pool. At a site I will not name, but is located in the Bears Ears, this site, It's a little south of the far hinterlands of the Canyonlands, but it's still technically, like I suppose most of southern Utah, southeastern Utah, it's still a land full of canyons. Uh, But this one's in the Bears Ears region. I once drove my truck down a stairwell of sandstone, gravel, and dirt on my way to find one of my favorite ruins I've ever visited. After months of sleuthing on the internet and eventually finding out exactly where this spot was, I was able to park my truck, walk down a winding path, and I ended up among the the best ruins that I've ever been to. In these ruins, I was walking amongst buildings and walls that were barely collapsed. Some of them hadn't even collapsed at all. In some places, there was no crumbling. There, I even peered into a kiva where the roof was being propped up by a log that a modern man placed there to save it from collapse. The walls of the kiva were still painted. There are stairs carved into the sandstone boulders they built their structures around and on top of. And all the while, the canyon floor, it was around 700 feet below the path, straight down a sheer cliff, inches from the edge of some of these walls. I imagine that they walked through the buildings, not on the outside of them, because it was hairy a couple times. It's my favorite site to have ever been in. 
maybe second. But it's definitely the most dangerous site I've ever explored. But there are, in that area, even more dangerous sites. Ones that require ropes and expertise and experts and the ability to use toe and finger holds that were drilled into the sandstone by the ancient ones. As of 2022, a whole bunch of Anasazi cords uh, have been found that were woven by them, and they were made up of yucca, dog, and even human hair, all intertwined together. But only one long and somewhat sturdy rope a rope capable of at least holding a man, only one of those has been found in all of the Anasazi world. And it was obviously found by the Weatherills. Now, more ropes may exist out there, uh, but none have been found yet. Maybe they didn't survive the passage of time. Or maybe they're under rocks or buried in under enough sand. Regardless, only that one rope has been found so far. And after that rope was recovered, it was recreated in a lab and then tested. And it was found that it can only hold 500 pounds. Now, that may seem like a lot. But if you're on that rope and and you take a whipper, it's going to snap and you're hitting the deck. Uh, Those are rock climbing terms for if you take a long fall, once that tension gets there, it's going to snap and you're going to hit the deck, which means you're hitting the ground and you're splat. Sorry, I used to rock climb a lot. I even won some competitions in Oklahoma when I was in college. But that was a very long time ago. That was ancient past. Kind of like uh, how old this rope was. Oftentimes, obviously this rope would have snapped if somebody took a fall. The ancient ones, uh, that means, the ancient ones reached these incredibly dangerous sites with little more than toe and finger holds that they carved into the rock. Or they used sticks that they plastered into cracks to hold on to. And they used the occasional ladder of notched wood. But that's it. They were by far the greatest climbers in all of the Southwest. Their Fremont neighbors were even more impressive, though. The ones to the north, north of Canyonlands and around there. They built structures in even harder-to-get alcoves and caves, with even steeper ledges. In Robert's uh, In Search of the Old Ones, he says, quote, The Navajo were so dazzled by the vertical skills of their predecessors that they attributed their technique to magic. The cliff dwellings, said Navajo sages, had been built by Anasazi who could fly, or who had special sticky feet, or who used shiny stones to slide up and down rock walls. The lizards of today, scuttling up and down the cliffs, are the descendants of the Anasazi, punished thus for having displeased the holy beings, end quote. At that site I just mentioned on Cedar Mesa, I met a man who said he had been going there for 30 years, quite often. His wife was there and his dog was there. But he was glad the site had remained such a mystery and that it was so hard to get to. That difficulty and danger, it kept the place beautiful and preserved. But he also said something about the the place that I have not forgotten. Something about the harsh realities of living there. He said, half jokingly, mind you, but he said, I'd hate to sleepwalk in these neighborhoods. Beyond the ever-present possibility of plummeting to your death high up in these canyon walls, you've just made it incredibly difficult to farm. Not only that, But water now becomes unpredictable, and every available nook and canyon cranny must be utilized just for an attempt to grow something, anything. And all the while you're huddling in fear of what's happening on top of the mesas. Yet those Anasazi, they still built and lived in that harsh and steep canyon land area, at least for a time. But truthfully, those Anasazi that fled to Cedar Mesa, where I just described those ruins, they had it better off than most others, especially the ones way up in Canyonlands, which is kind of far from the Chaco Core. I have a storied past with Cedar Mesa, and I've written a short story up on the, which I put on the website. It's a haunting place. It's a place I love dearly, but one that leaves me feeling uneasy. Uneasy. 
I explained this feeling that I get sometimes up there to my wife. On our way there, uh, when we were driving up from the Colorado River, up to the Bears Ears, and then down 261 towards Muley Point and the Mokai Dugway. She said she could feel it too. Now I'm not a superstitious person, but sometimes I've been in a place, or around a place, that felt heavier than the air on a coastal Georgia island. There's an uneasiness that can settle into your bones, into your consciousness, almost like a warning. I once excitedly got ready to spend the night among some beautiful Mesa, Mesa Rimside ruins in central Arizona. My truck was parked just outside of this massive, but at that point crumbled, wall that had once defensively surrounded the place. And I was going to sleep right there in the bed of my truck with the ruins behind me, and while I watched the sun set behind the Bradshaw Mountains, I think it was the Bradshaw Mountains. But this, th- this slight nagging feeling of fear had uh, overtaken me. Maybe fear isn't the right word, but the feeling that I was trespassing and, and the feeling maybe I was pushing my luck had overcome me. So I was forced to camp some ways away after my second camping spot was vetoed by a lion print in the mud. Maybe that feeling was just uh, the feeling of something watching me. That was Arizona, though. I don't know much about the history of the people of central Arizona, the ones who had built those structures that are so similar to the Anasazis, which I believe are the Mogollon. But I do know a lot about Cedar Mesa, and that knowledge doesn't quite lend itself to the feeling of tranquility, which, honestly, Cedar Mesa in that area offers plenty of but only if you're ignorant of the place's past. I love Cedar Mesa, and I cannot get enough of it. I will visit it constantly all the time. I will take my wife. I will take my children to Cedar Mesa. We will explore the canyons and see the petroglyphs and the paintings. We will feel the potsherds in our hands. We will look into the kivas, but we'll also feel the reverence for the place. We'll feel its haunting beauty. And I don't want to get too silly and mystical about it all. But some places have something about them, and it's worth paying attention to that something when you're there. Barillo helps explain this leeriness one can get, and I certainly got, in the area when he says, quote, For about 600 years, farmers in the Bears Ears area lived adjacent to the areas they farmed, journeying to freshwater sources when needed. And then, during the early 1200s, many of them began doing just the opposite, living by their water sources and journeying to their fields. Settlements often aggregated around springs, in a possessive posture that contrasts markedly from what looks almost like a taboo against settlement in direct proximity to springs in earlier periods. End quote. Another quote about the change to cliff dwellings um, comes from David Roberts in Search of the Old Ones, when he says, quote, Yet, I also had to recognize that cliff dwellings were not the Anasazi norm. Far fewer than 10% of all their habitations, from the Archaic through Pueblo III, were built on ledges above the void, he goes on to say. Only in the last half of the 13th century did cliff dwellings predominate, and then, as experts are beginning to prove, almost surely as a response to stress and threat, as beautiful as the tourist of today finds a cliff dwelling, such as Betitakin, the men and women who lived there must have sensed its cramped confinement as a compromise, an uneasy solution to a world torn by fear and hunger. End quote. Something was pushing the original inhabitants of the Four Corners, something was pushing their backs against the wall. Something, or more likely, someone. As I've already mentioned, that southern faction of the Anasazi were a real threat. Enough to change one's entire world. On Cedar Mesa and Comb Ridge, and Comb Ridge is that long wall of land that's been pushed up by geological forces under the earth that stretches for quite a bit of distance from above Cedar Mesa down beyond Monument Valley. Comb Ridge is actually an amazing area filled with ruins and history, and it just looks really cool. You'll have to look at the website to to see pictures of it, but also pull up maps, pull up any maps app, and go to, let's say, Bluff or Mexican Hat or Monticello. Zoom out, 
on the satellite setting and you will see a line, literally a line going, I think it's southwest from there. And it's just a wall of rock. But anyways, the settlements on Cedar Mesa and around uh, Comb Ridge continued around this point of the 1200s to grow larger and larger as refugees from a crumbling Chaco built great kivas, great houses, great towers, and pueblos in what looks like an attempt at uh, recreating that Chaco and magic, but with a certain Mesa Verde flair. If you've never been out to these areas, again, I know I just said it, but any of them. I've been talking about Cedar Mesa, Mesa Verde, Chaco Canyon, Sleeping Ute Mountain, even up north in Canyonlands and LaSalle's. You've either got to check out the website. Well, no, I'm not, not either. First, you go and check out the website. I've spent a lot of good time on that and many, many years and hours in that, those places taking awesome pictures. But more importantly than checking out my website, you have got to get yourself there. I'm trying to describe these places as best I can. Well, not quite, but because I always keep referring you to my website. But just know that these places are the greatest places on the whole planet, and you have got to get yourself there. I am absolutely one that is perfectly okay with going out there and never seeing another soul. But, but that's the selfish part. The unselfish part is the one that's making a podcast and a website, directing people to these places and talking about them building up your excitement for them. So I think everyone should just go. Just be respectful when you do go. Okay, my rant is over. But Cedar Mesa, this hinterland, this not quite Chaco and core, but enough of Ch enough Anasazi live there for it to be a, an important place. But Cedar Mesa had been inhabited for a very long time. In the 700s, they were making fired clay pottery, but it was red as opposed to that famous black on white of Chaco and the other eastern settlements. Then, in the 1200s, it would switch to an orange color. And there was no doubt that that switch was probably because of the Chacoan refugees who were spilling into the area and influencing the Cedar Mesa ways of making ceramics. But not only ceramics changed on the bear's ears, once those pushy Anasazi had briefly settled in, their kivas also began to be decorated differently as well. And I have seen those differently decorated kivas myself. Just south of Cedar Mesa, in the Cayenta region of northern Arizona, the people of Navajo National Monument, they were also melding their practices and ceramics with the Mesa Verde ways. And all the while, the cliff dwellings and massive pueblos were being erected in both orderly and haphazard fashion. And each new settlement looks like it was being connected physically, if not through those fire hills that we talked about last time where the fires would be set and the messages could be sent. If not through that, then through a plog points out, he has a really great diagram of uh, a canyon where there's one settlement called Tower House that is adjacent to Fireside, another canyon um, settlement. But there is a wall, a canyon wall in between the two. Well, the Anasazi, they just went ahead and they just uh, cut a notch into that wall to make sure that both Pueblos and, or settlements could see each other. I mean, talk about your monumental architecture or maybe ceremonial architecture. Either way, you can take the Anasazi out of Chaco, but you can't take the Chaco out of the Anasazi. We have now come to that part of the story where the main character no longer becomes the Anasazi, but it is actually the violence that the Anasazi uh, are engulfed in, perpetrate, live with, I don't know, die from, but it gets pretty gnarly. So, hide your wife, hide your kids, this is now rated R. The violence I keep mentioning that the people are fleeing from, uprooting their entire lives for, uprooting their family, themselves, their clans, the violence they're moving away from, they're moving to difficult terrains too. And even when they move there, they rebuild Chaco again. What kind of violence would drive people to make such a drastic change? change? 
on the sides of boulders and cliff faces, and even on the sides of ceramic vessels and pots, one can find, carved or painted, a litany of evidence for conflict. You've got swords, shields, and atlatls. There are beheadings, limbs being ripped apart, detached heads, scalps. There's blood pouring out of both the defenseless and figures actively defending. There is actually a surprising number of figures with weapons in the Southwest, everywhere, in all forms of art. Sometimes the figures are behind shields, which there are a lot of, or sometimes they're seen proudly with their weapons in the open, asking for a fight. There's even a panel somewhere in the Four Corners, I do not know where, I've only read about it, in Craig Childs, as I look to my bookcase, Tracing Time, which he talks about uh, lots of, it's mostly about rock art, or petroglyphs, or pictographs, what have you, stories. But there's even a panel somewhere in the Four Corners area with a man behind a shield holding his weapon while wearing what appear to be mountain lion ears right on his head. That brings to mind for me a fierce fighter who knows his stuff. Or maybe even a fierce fighter down from Mesoamerica who were known for wearing jaguar skins. Either way, you don't want to mess with somebody wearing mountain lion ears. Because you got to ask, how did he get those ears? Violence, unlike what the Pueblo Mystique would have you believe, did in fact occur in the Southwest. And it occurred brutally. As it does often everywhere, with all cultures and all societies and all continents and all time periods. But it didn't occur all the time here in the Southwest at this time that we're talking about now, or at least before the modern era. A couple episodes ago, I mentioned that during the run-up to Chaco and its greatness, or, you know, height, violence was slowly increasing. But not on a grand scale. The violence was more of a personal type, a small-scale raiding, neighbor against neighbor. Uh, Then once Chaco came along, Surprisingly, because of what happens afterwards, or maybe not surprisingly. But when Chaco came to be, the area grew quite peaceful. It seems the secondary state leaders or rotating princely kings, they were able to keep the peace among their various clans and families and groups. And this was a great thing for the people that lived during the height of Chaco. Because during the lead up to the grand secondary state uh, of Chaco Canyon, things were getting dicey. Pardon my gnarly pun that you will soon understand. David Roberts, in In Search of the Old Ones, talks about one of these uh, grander scale violent episodes when he mentions a site that is dated to 700 years prior to the collapse of the Chaco and Aztec region. He says of the crime scene, quote, We know very little about violence in Basket Maker 2 times, but Christy Turner, who wrote Man Corn, by the way, but Christy Turner and Winston Hurst's painstaking reconstruction of what happened at Cave 7 in Whiskers Draw gives a vivid look at one event. In that shallow alcove in the middle of nowhere, sometime before A.D. 500, more than 90 men, women, and children were either massacred in an all-out attack or ritually executed. It was not enough simply to kill these unfortunates. Some were scalped. The carnage involved stabbing by daggers, shooting with atlatl darts, bludgeoning, scalping, and possibly even torture. End quote. 300 years after Cave 7, In a pit house dated to the mid-800s that is located in southwest Colorado, near that uh, Grand Mesa Verde and also near Sleeping Ute Mountain, an episode of extreme violence was discovered during construction of a local reservoir. In that pit house, 14,880 chopped up bone fragments Pieces of 33 individuals ranging in age from 18 months to 50 years old 
They were found scattered along the floor, along with scalped skulls, smashed forearms, and even four dismembered dogs. They were all found amongst the ruins. Curiously, no feet or hands were discovered. Among all the 15,000 purposely taken apart and disassembled piece by piece bones, no hands or feet were found. These instances have become known as extreme processing events. After telling my wife this story, probably one too many times, she said, well, this makes sense if you're trying to punish someone. And maybe if you're trying to punish someone enough to where they can't get into the afterlife. And yeah, she's brilliant. And she could be on to something. But her analysis of this possibly being a punishment doesn't make the area or the story any less unsettling. That instance, in particular, of extreme processing may have been a warning to the nearby settlements or that surrounded it not to mess with what would soon be Chaco Canyon. Because remember, this was uh, in the 800s, long before Chaco Canyon, well, you know, a couple hundred years before Chaco Canyon actually became the behemoth that it did. But clearly, this was a message. In reality, as I've already mentioned, Chaco may have started out as a mix of southern Mesoamerican ways, a couple people coming up. It may have mixed with those guys, and it may have mixed with a culture that was already forming independently in this very area of southern Colorado. Um, it may have been around for a long time, this Mesa Verde southern Colorado culture. Their ancestors are probably the ones who painted and etched elaborately haunted figures into the cliffs, uh, boulders, and earthen walls of the southwest. I've been calling them the Mesa Verde home team. Um, some argue that Chaco's initial area of growth was in the Mesa Verde area. Now others say it was from Mexico. Lexan says it's from Mexico. And in reality, it's probably both. I believe both are correct. I'll go into it a little bit later. But this event may have been staged by a proto-Chacoan system of rulers or a government as a warning as a warning to people for whatever reason that were breaking the rules. Not long after this particular episode, the people would move down south and inhabit that canyon, and they would inhabit it in relative peace. Lexan says of that Chacoan peace that, quote, the diminution of violence during Chaco's era probably reflected Chaco's peacekeeping or order-keeping function, enforced by periodic acts of violence. End quote. During Chaco, again from Lexan, quote, farmsteads dotted the landscape, spaced at distances that suggests an absence of fear. End quote. Some believe, and Pueblo Mystique dictates, that the rulers accomplished this region wide peaceful time by ritual, of course, kumbaya, and all that. Lexan says it was by seldom use of force by the state. Violence like taking apart your family and your dogs, for goodness sake, bone by bone, and leaving them scattered around for those around to take the hint. In one site around the time of Chaco, so now we're talking the 1100s or so, one of these little farmsteads, surrounded by countless other farmsteads, is found to have been burned, and that burned pueblo contained the remains of that pueblo's occupants. Like the extreme processing event, uh, described earlier, neither this place nor that one were ever returned to again. Clearly, those that perpetrated this violence were sending a message. The fact that it was an isolated incident in the middle of a whole bunch of, of farmsteads that were untouched suggests that message was from someone they knew, not a foreign invader. A foreign invader would have no doubt burned the other farmsteads around them to the ground as well. I mean, it could have been, as Plog suggested, quote, trading partners one day may be bitter enemies the next, end quote. I don't think the rulers of Chaco would have allowed for such petty acts of violence by other Pueblos. I believe they themselves were the perpetrators of these acts of violence. Here's an extended quote from Lexan to further push this idea that the violence, the violence that we're talking about during Chaco, 
and even before, was state-sanctioned. Quote, The violence that killed, and sometimes cannibalized, people was, I think, socially sanctioned. That is, it was an expected part of the social contract, the stuff in the nasty small print, and not a surprise raid, a random war, or a barbarian invasion. Executing witches, for example, would be socially sanctioned violence. Witchcraft, broadly defined, means not playing by the rules. Witches or tax evaders, the people were just as dead. He goes on to say, Extended families, or even small settlements, were rounded up, executed, and then systematically butchered, cut into pieces. Not a hit-and-run raid, but something drawn out and deliberate by guys who knew what they were about. Perhaps this spectacle was public. Certainly people for miles around would know about it, but, and this is important, settlement patterns did not change. People continued to live in isolated single-family farmsteads, at least initially. No defensive steps were taken, and we know they knew how to defend their settlements. Later, isolated farmsteads aggregated into large towns, sometimes walled, or shifted up into cliff overhangs, and so forth. But during Chaco's reign, when these violent events were less frequent than later, settlement patterns did not change. People did not react as if there was widespread war, or random violence, or indeed anything out of the ordinary. Not that mass executions were ordinary, but apparently the knowledge of such executions did not alter the basic settlement patterns, and all that implies, social structures, economies, lifestyles, etc. I think that whoever did the killing had a socially sanctioned right to do so. That would be consistent with a state's use of power. End quote. A state's use of power. That benefits nobody but the state. What Lexan is describing is something he has dubbed a socialization for fear. David Roberts would write for the Smithsonian, not in one of his two books I've mentioned, but for the Smithsonian Magazine in a 2003 article titled Riddles of the Anasazi. He would talk about this state-sanctioned violence, and he would quote our boy Lexan. He'd quote him a good bit, actually. Roberts would explain Lexan's quote-unquote socialization for fear when he wrote that this socialization for fear produced a quote, long-lasting violence that tore apart the Anasazi culture. In the 11th and early 12th centuries, there was little archaeological evidence of true warfare, Lexan says. But there were executions. As he puts it, and he's now directly quoting Lexan, there seemed to have been goon squads. Things were not going well for the leaders, and the governing structure wanted to perpetuate itself by making an example of social outcasts. The leaders executed and even cannibalized them. End quote. This practice, perpetrated by Chaco Canaan rulers, created a society-wide paranoia, according to Lexan's theory, thus socializing the Anasazi people to live in constant fear. Lexan goes on to describe a grim scenario that he believes emerged during the next few hundred years. He's quoting Lexan. Entire villages go after one another, he says, alliance against alliance, and it persists well into the Spanish period. End all quotes well into the Spanish period? He may be referring to the Zuni scalp ceremony, or maybe those ceremonial heart carving knives I have mentioned multiple times that were found at Chaco. We know that those knives, or at least knives very similar to it, were used well into the Spanish period. They recorded it. They were used to carve out hearts after slashing the victim's throat. And that was Ancestral Puebloans. We're not talking about Anasazi. But we'll get into those in greater detail next time. Remember those monumental Chacoan roads? Could they have been used to transport armies or those goon squads in plain view of the countryside as they headed towards the state's next unfortunate victim? Whether they marched entire armies down the roads to outliers or, or not... The Chaco Aztec secondary state definitely used violence to keep the greater region in a state of peace. Peace and fear, but relative peace. Well, that is at least until the 1200s when Chaco itself came crashing down in a fiery furnace of burned corn and human bodies. <laughs>
Across the Pacific Ocean, on the far-off island of Lombok in Indonesia, stay with me, a catastrophic eruption exploded into the atmosphere and became one of the largest volcanic eruptions since the end of the Ice Age, actually, even up to this day. The 1257 Somalis volcanic eruption not only wiped out entire islands of people in the Pacific, but it had devastating consequences in places as far away as Europe. According to National Geographic, the eruption was, quote, an estimated eight times as large as the famed Krakatau eruption of 1833 and twice as large as Tambora in 1815, end quote. And that 1815 Tambora eruption was so influential on uh, Europe, well, at, at least it made Edvard Munch's The Scream possible because he witnessed a sunset. And he said it felt like the entire earth was screaming because of that fiery red and yellow and orange sunset. But in 1257, long before, 600 years before that Tambora eruption, the Somalis volcanic eruption was gnarly. Medieval texts uh, at the time describe atrocious weather following the eruption in the summer of 1258. Uh, that summer brought cold, unrelenting rain, and devastating flooding. Bruce Campbell, no, not that one. Bruce Campbell from Cambridge has said of England, quote, In 1258, a baronial opposition to Henry III erupted, and the government became locked in a constitutional conflict. The country had found itself in the grip of a serious food crisis. To blame was a run of bad weather and failed harvests. Thousands of famished famine refugees flocked to London in quest of food and charity, where many of them perished and were buried in mass graves. The multiple burials recently discovered and excavated in the cemetery of the Hospital of St. Mary's Spital highlight the plight of the poor at this time of political turmoil. End quote. To sum it all up, is Professor Levine who told the BBC, quote, We cannot say for sure these two events are linked, but the populations would definitely have been stressed. End quote. I also can't say for sure that Chaco Canyon was affected by this eruption all the way across the Pacific Ocean, but it sure does coincide nicely with it. This massive eruption, which definitely would have been noticed by the people who had perfectly mapped the stars and their surrounding geography, well, this eruption's possible changes to the weather may have been just the sign a dissatisfied ruler, rotating ruler, was looking for to crack open the canyon and take power for himself. From Barillo, quote, the downfall of Chaco, a system of community organization that encompassed the entire Pueblo world, would have been like a mountain falling into the sea. Not just a single splash, but a series of reverberating socio-cultural tsunamis. End quote. The downfall, or schism, or I'm pretty sure, I mean, it's a civil war. Whatever it was that happened to Chaco not only tore up the peace that had held for hundreds of years under Chaco, but it would eventually engulf and tear up the entire southwestern region as well. We've seen something similar recently, almost 20 years ago with the invasion of Iraq. So Saddam Hussein kept the peace for decades until he was thrown out of power, and then we saw what happened there, and we're still seeing it. But let's get back to the southwest. Childs says, quote, the archaeological record for the 13th century around the Four Corners reads like a war crime indictment. Infants and children burned alive, skeletons marked by butchery, entire villages left with bodies unburied. Rock art depicts people bearing round decorated shields and using weapons on one another. End quote. This would have been a civil war of Anasazi versus Anasazi. We already know the people that made up what we call the Anasazi were of differing origins and differing ethnicities from around the southwest and beyond. And it's possible the only thing holding them back from killing their neighbors, killing each other, were their leaders in those great houses. Childs says of the Civil War, quote, The attackers, it appears, were the Anasazi themselves. The Anasazi were not merely one group of people. They were many. Many. 
Even in the context of a single settlement, multiple ethnicities have been found. Some groups of skeletons within a pueblo displaying more injuries, both healed and fatal, than others. End quote. In Chaco Canyon proper, evidence of domestic abuse has been discovered in the buried bodies of females who were probably slaves. It's even possible Chaco's leaders raided for female slaves. In the late 19th century, the aforementioned Weatherill brothers wrote that they, quote, found the skeletons of a man and a woman with a child 12 or 14 years old. Their skulls had been crushed in, and the boys found that the blade of a large stone axe beside them just fitted the dents in the skulls. With the murdered three was a child only a few months old, with the bones of its skull scattered. End quote. During this Anasazi civil war, there's evidence that granaries were raided of their stores of food. Around the countryside, palisades of wood or stone began to encircle some villages, but it didn't always work. From Plog, quote, Burned settlements where the complete artifact assemblages and burned and unburied skeletons suggest that the occupants were surprised by the fire. Mass graves that include the skeletal parts of several individuals or burned bone, evidence of scalping, kiva and rock art that illustrates combat, and, in a few instances, skeletons with embedded dart or arrow points. End quote. There's evidence of hammers, hammers used in bone crushings. There's chop marks on bones. There are polished bones, burned bones. There are a lot of bones scattered among burned kivas and pueblos and surrounding uh, all the surrounding areas. Skulls have been found stacked inside the ventilator shaft of kivas. I talked earlier about the axes in the Great Tower kiva ventilator shafts. Well, there's also skulls. The ventilator shaft would have been important for letting in fresh air. So imagine the message you're sending by shoving in not a skull, because these skulls had faces, but shoving in a decapitated head into where the air comes in to replenish your kiva. But those skulls didn't always have faces. There's evidence for faces having been chopped off. I've seen horrible images of elephants having that same fate when poachers try to get their tusks. It's not a pretty sight on an elephant. I imagine it was not a pretty sight on a human being either. But that is quite a message to send during a violent civil war. And that practice of chopping off the face would have been accompanied with scalping. And it would have turned the victim's head skin into a deboned portable trophy that would have been wrapped around a staff, as Robert puts it. A portable trophy complete with an elaborate hairdo and face painting. Elsewhere on Cedar Mesa, in the Grand Gulch area, Richard Weatherill found the remains, the mummified remains, of a person that he dubbed Cut Into Man. He named him that because the body had been cut completely in two, right through the hips and the abdomen. Then, the body was sewn back together with twine of braided human hair. His entrails had been removed, and not on purpose, like uh, how the Egyptians uh, removed the entrails during their practice of mummification. They were maybe his entrails of cut in two man, they were probably eaten. The Anasazi didn't practice intentional mummification, although mummies are occasionally found all throughout the Southwest. Spread around cut in two man were what appear to be offerings of dismembered arms and legs from other people, not his own. The reason behind this macabre scene is so far completely unknown. At the foot of Sleeping Ute Mountain, not far from the Yellow Jacket Pueblo and Hovenweep and modern-day canyons of the ancients, at the foot of that Sleeping Ute Mountain lies one of my favorite hikes, the Sand Canyon Hike. And near there is what's known as the Sand Canyon and Castle Rock Pueblos. And in those pueblos, it looks like nothing other than a massacre has taken place. Childs says, quote, Castle Rock was built around a sturdy mast of rock, a natural watchtower at the bottom of the mountain. Excavating only about 5% of this site, crews came upon the partial remains of 41 bodies in a state of disarray. 
Most of the remains of a man with much of his face removed were found in one room, while his right leg, the bones still articulated, was found in another room more than 300 feet away, end quote. At San Canyon Pueblo, a similar violent fate was discovered. Unburied bodies being strewn about. There's evidence of scalping on both adults and even an eight-year-old. And the remains of a man with most of his leg bones having been smashed and splintered while he was still alive. San Canyon wasn't a small Pueblo either. By 1250, it had a massive site and closing wall. And that wall was completed in a single construction which would have taken about 40 people uh, two months to complete. The Pueblo also had 90 kivas and 420 rooms, but researchers suggest it may have only taken 200 warriors to take the whole Pueblo down and then scatter its residents' remains throughout it. And they probably did it pretty quickly, too. Inside the Pueblo lies an unfinished pot, not yet with its paint complete. Also in Sand Canyon, Roberts describes yet another violent but very curious find uh, that he talks about being found in the ruins during a conversation with Bruce Bradley from the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. Quote, In one kiva, we discovered a man of about 45 or 50 with his skull bashed in, and he had six toes. Now, Neil Judd, who is an older archaeologist from the olden days, Found that Neil Judd found a six-toed guy in the ruins of Pueblo Bonito back in 1920s. There are six-toed petroglyphs on the rock wall directly behind Bonito. And even today, among the Pueblos, polydactyly, having an extra toe or finger, is regarded as a special gift. End quote. 45 or 50 is old for an Anasazi and kind of rare. But surprisingly, polydactyly or having six digits on one hand, or more importantly, foot, isn't that rare in the ancestral Puebloan world. This is a small, but an extremely interesting little tangent. So, way back in the archaic episode of this series, um, when I talked about the ancient ones after the Ice Age, uh, before the basket makers, or maybe I did talk about the basket makers. Anyways, I mentioned in that archaic episode how six toes shows up all over the American Hemisphere, but especially it shows up in the Southwest. I've personally seen them everywhere. And Childs mentions that uh, they, Craig Childs, he mentions that they may signify someone with power or as being a spiritual leader. I quoted that back in that uh, archaic episode. What I didn't mention in that episode was the buried, dead, and murdered who had six toes during the Chacoan Civil War. As strange as it sounds, it may have been a prerequisite, having six toes, to being a leader or a princely ruler. While it did offer the owner of the sixth toe a possible success in riches uh, during their life, like turquoise and a great house, it didn't always guarantee your safety, as the six-toed man at Sand Canyon, who had his skull bashed in, can attest. Curiously, 3.1% of the population of Chaco Canyon itself, uh, the bodies that have been recovered, 3.1% of the population have been found to have six toes, while only 0.2, so 3.1 to 0.2% of Native Americans today have them, and 0.13% of white Americans have them. I have absolutely no idea what six toes meant in the belief system of the Anasazi, but I like to think uh, it, it did indeed represent movement and migration. Maybe like how I mentioned in the archaic episode. They may have used the six toes to hearken back to a time before the Pueblos, before the Altipetl, before Chaco, when the people could move freely across the land. Maybe the Anasazi believed someone with six toes represented the old ways, when the Clovis, when their ancient ones, when the Clovis would winter in Florida and summer at the Great Lakes during their relentless and never-ending pursuit of the mammoths. Maybe venerating someone with six toes was worshiping the past and the past migrations that they could no longer recreate because of this Chaco and polity. Or maybe they were just into weird feet. I thoroughly enjoyed the Sand Canyon hike and Canyons of the Ancients. 
I was the only person there that day, and I hiked amongst the beautiful ruins on the meandering trail, although I didn't hike amongst the Sand Canyon Pueblo itself. Uh, the mountain, Sleeping you, it lies behind you for most of the hike. It's always there looking over you as you take in the red and white sandstone and the various camouflaged ruins. It was a reverent place uh, back when I was walking it, and I didn't even yet know its history, but that history does get worse. At the besieged Castle Rock Pueblo, mugs have been found to contain the cooked remains of human tissue and muscle. Talk about your man, corn. An archaeologist who worked at a site in southern Colorado and found evidence of cannibalism, he said that the people who were killed were, quote, partially or entirely skinned, segmented, roasted, and defleshed. The crania and postcranial skeletal elements were fractured with a focus on the larger limb bone shafts. This fracturing is inferred to result from efforts to recover brain and yellow marrow tissue. End quote. They go on to suggest that the polished bone they found was probably boiled in those famous Anasazi ceramic pots, and they were boiled to extract the bone grease. They also suggest the bones may have been crushed and eaten in what were called bone cakes, I don't even want to know. Uh, my wife and I just had a red velvet cake for our wedding with some cream cheese icing. I think my father ate half the cake. I don't even want to know what a bone cake is. The other bones would have been brewed in a special man corn stew. There are 19 of these sites discovered as of Plog's 2008 publishing. It was actually hard to find if that number still holds up um, if it, or if it has changed in the last 14 years. I couldn't quite find that online. Pueblo Mystique would rather bury the evidence that mancorn was ever indulged in. Uh, this study, and others that Plog quotes, does say that, quote, alternative hypotheses that might account for these remains, such as ritual behavior or carnivore disturbance, have been examined and consistently found insufficient to explain all aspects of the skeletal remains, end quote. Elsewhere, around the beautiful Sleeping Ute Mountain, beautiful but rather haunting, Sleeping Ute Mountain, Childs lays out even more evidence of mancorn in this extended quote. One crew uncovered human bones scattered all over the place, as if the people had been hacked apart. They also uncovered catacombs, stocked with food, where they came upon more human skeletons. Not burials, but people who had been murdered. One of the surveyors told me that his excavations looked like a crime scene. People killed trying to get away. Others killed in their hiding places. This field worker explained that he and his colleagues had found a grinding stone that contained crushed human finger bones. At that point, they knew that the slaughter had gone beyond the bounds of customary violence. The surveyors had loosened a stone slab in the ground, exposing a deep teardrop-shaped storage chamber below its rounded walls lined neatly with stonework. The chamber was conspicuously empty, but for a single, bold, human defecation laid right in the center. One of the surveyors had done his master's thesis on pre-Columbian human feces, and he identified the material immediately, noticing its pumice white color, which indicated that the person had been eating bone marrow. He said, We shaved it down to a core that we knew would not be contaminated by any of us, and then it was tested, and they found the presence of human DNA. Not only one person's DNA, but DNA from four different people. Uh, whoever left the excrement had been a cannibal. End quote. Earlier, I quoted Roberts, who talked about the mancorn author, Christy Turner. And I quoted his Christy Turner and his research into the old basket maker and archaic butchery. But Roberts has a conversation with Turner um, in, in Search of the Old Ones, where Turner displays unmistakable evidence of cannibalism for the author. You need a microscope to see pot polishing, said Turner. I stare through the lens at the end of a broken tibia. See the sheen on the outer corners of the tip? Turner asked. I nodded. That's the polish caused by bones bouncing around in a pot as they're being stewed. He later says, quote, The clincher? added Turner. 
is that the process is exactly the same as the Anasazi used to butcher and cook antelope and prairie dog, two of their staple foods. What other possible explanation could there be? End quote. By a mid-90s tally, the number of cannibalism victims discovered had reached 300. As of 2022, there may be a lot more. I couldn't find it. That Pueblo mystique. The term mancorn that Christy Turner uses uh, cleverly isn't actually his own term, but it's the literal translation of the Nahuatl word tlacatlaoli, which refers to a, quote, sacred meal of sacrificed human meat cooked with corn, end quote. And Christy Turner used that term purposefully. He believes, after searching for cannibalism elsewhere on the continent, and not really finding any evidence for it, at least nearby, he believes that cannibalism came up from Mexico, just like everything else. He also believes this cannibalism, which flourished from 8900, well, I am a little bit before, but around 8900, all the way up until the end of the Chaco-Aztec era. He believes this cannibalism was part of Lexan's socialization for fear, meaning the eating of people in the Anasazi world was state-sanctioned and used quite often. Turner actually has this to say in Mancorn, quote, Terrorizing, mutilating, and murdering might be evolutionarily useful behaviors when directed against unrelated competitors. And what better way to amplify opponents' fear than to reduce victims to the subhuman level of cooked meat, especially when they include infants and children, from whom no power or prestige could be derived, but whose consumption would surely further terrorize, demean, and insult their helpless parents or community. The benefits would be threefold. Community control, control of reproductive behavior, that is, dominating access to women, and food. From the standpoint of sociobiology, then, cannibalism could well represent useful behavior done by well-adjusted, normal adults acting out their ultimate, evolutionarily channeled behavior. On the other hand, one can easily look upon violence and cannibalism as socially pathological. End quote. No matter the reason, cannibalism was practiced in the Southwest. But the Anasazi weren't just warring amongst themselves. To the north, the Fremont were changing their entire way of life, their entire way of living, by building even more precariously and dangerously even than the Anasazi. They were building in alcoves, high up caves, and canyon cliff edges. In the Lost World, Roberts cites archaeologist Shannon Boomgarden's work in a prominent Fremont canyon with hundreds of sites. He explains that her research uncovered that the Fremont built hundreds of small and hidden, at least from the valley floor, hundreds and sm- hundreds of small hidden granaries, coupled with large and visible granaries, visible from the valley floor, but extremely difficult to get to. These granaries would have had a clear line of sight from at least eight different settlements on each valley floor. These people, uh, the Fremont, were building highly defensively, and keeping their precious corn as safe as they knew how. Also in The Lost World, David Roberts, the author, he got to know an extremely interesting and old rancher named Waldo Wilcox. Uh, Waldo adored the Fremont, and he knew their world like the back of his hand. He had actually been living on the land for over 50 years. He has kind of a A great, but kind of a sad story as well. Not sad, but the ending is frustrating. But he would tell Roberts and other archaeologists, many of which didn't believe him, that almost every strewn about Fremont skeleton he came across over those 50 years was littered with arrowheads and spear points. Not far from Waldo's ranch, in a hard-to-reach winding canyon, the Fremont would create an enormous rock art panel depicting what looked like stage battles with the Anasazi. It appears to be a type of warfare where only a few, instead of the many, uh, battle or die or are disabled. The panel depicts warriors hurdling spears and atlatls at each other with shields up, and the panels are located in a massive open space. At the top of this massive open space, kind of like an arena, the area does. It looks like an arena. When Childs describes the old rock art hunter from Moab who showed him the panel, 
and tells him this particular theory that it was just uh, staged warfare and not full-on battles. When Childs describes that, I became incredibly intrigued. It kind of reminds me of like Northern Indians counting coup or those big Greek battles where only the heroes fought as armies lined up on, on both sides. Now, maybe that's just in historical fiction, but I'm not sure. After this civil war and regional conflicts that erupted, the Fremont, who had been interacting with the Anasazi for hundreds of years by now, well, the Fremont straight up abandoned agriculture altogether, and they headed even further north, away from these violent man corn eaters. It's hard to overstate the violence that erupted as Chaco collapsed. It's hard to overstate the violence during this civil war that ensued. But thankfully, it didn't last too long. Then again, if you remember, the average age of the skeletons recovered from Chaco was 27 years old. Decades of violence could have lasted a person's entire lifetime. Violence may have been the only thing some of these Anasazi youth knew. Eventually, though, the people would start to flee for the aforementioned areas like Mesa Verde, the Bears Ears, and down south into Arizona, uh, where long-standing neighbors like the Mogollon and Hohokam, who were no doubt heavily influenced by Chaco, but down in Arizona, these people were probably trying to avoid Chaco's same fate. It's also during this time that quite a few peoples and families and clans would have said enough is enough, and they would have gone their separate ways to the other side of the Jemez Mountains towards the Rio Grande Pueblos, leaving Chaco and its violent man maze mess behind. Despite the violence, the people were continuing to congregate and the population was continuing to rise. Meanwhile, a new kind of trouble was brewing, this time in the form of all-natural changes, this time in the form of the quote-unquote Great Drought of 1277. But by then, the writing was already on the wall, and according to archaeologist Susan Ryan, the people may have been amassing after the violence to disappear together to move to their next location on the Chaco Meridian as one big, safe group. Uh, Ryan also suggests that this ending of the era of Chaco and Aztec, this second phase post-Civil War, this was a much more peaceful time than Chaco's end may have been. It, I mean, there is a lot of evidence for burning beyond the burning that we spoke of earlier, but there's a lot of evidence for burning and Ryan believes that they intentionally burned their homes and kivas as they left, and they even left their belongings inside them as the wooden ceilings would have caved in. In one burned kiva, Susan found an upturned painted black-on-white bowl that had two baskets neatly tucked inside them. The first basket had coarsely ground corn, while the second had finely ground corn flour. And around these corn baskets... Uh, inside the upturned bowl were also ladles and other artifacts that would seemingly have been placed there on purpose before setting the place on fire. There's a name for this in archaeology, and that is ceremonial burning. And the Anasazi were big fans of ceremonial burning, it appears. I've even seen burnt ruins in southeast Utah. And actually at the time I figured that they were set on purpose, not during warfare. And that is not because I am an educated person in archaeology. I just thought it made sense. And it has been suggested that maybe some of these fires were set by enemies or as enemies approached, but Susan Ryan argues that this time that is not the case. She points to evidence of only 300 years before when these people left the first time, or maybe the last time. They'd done the same thing then, and even that burning wasn't the first time ceremonial burning took place. Almost 2,000 years before that, or at least before now, there's evidence for ceremonial burning in the American Southwest, especially in this area of the Four Corners and Southern Colorado. But violence did continue to break out, although not as strong. Fires do start to spread, though, from Pueblos and Kivas, whether they were started intentionally or through combat. Honestly, in the end, that did not matter. The Anasazi were amassing to migrate. The first to leave were the people of Cedar Mesa in the 1270s, then Mesa Verde by the 1280s, 
in northern Arizona at Navajo National Monument, the last of the construction there stopped in 1285. And by 1290, they too were heading south. Everyone was heading south. The ones that stayed, and there's evidence for small occupations after the initial mass exodus, but the ones that stayed would eventually join their brothers and sisters in their heading south on that Chaco Meridian spiral. Or maybe they joined other ancestral Puebloan peoples. Some, like the Fremont, would probably become the Ute and Hopi, but no researcher knows for certain their fate. This moving out and this uh, migration and abandonment, it may not have been as sudden or extreme as I just made it out to be or as it's made out to be by some researchers, although it did happen. Lexon says it would be wise to think of it, quote, not as a sudden last-ditch upheaval, but as a series of tricklings out of the homeland stretching across the whole of the 13th century, and perhaps beginning in the 12th. End quote. Regardless of how quickly the abandonment happened, by 1300, the entire Four Corners region would become completely depopulated of all Anasazi. The old theory to help explain the complete abandon uh, was to blame it on invading marauders, brand new people from up north, like the Navajo and Apache, who then ran the Anasazi out of town. But that does not hold up to more recent archaeology. Another factor could be the rapid arroyo cutting, which is plausible and still happens today and it's devastating, but it isn't sufficient alone to explain the complete abandonment of all areas. Some have blamed the abandonment and movement on rain, or the lack thereof. But the pack up and moving began before the rains fluctuated, and that period of exceptional plenty in the southwest that period that happened totally and completely naturally, like all climatic changes, that eventually began to turn sour, but the people were leaving even before that. Besides, the evidence of disease and malnutrition at this time, it just doesn't show up in the human record. Not yet, at least. As Lexon puts it, the people left in a time of good climate and bad vibes. The tree ring data, though, it does support the lack of rainfall, from 1276 to 1299, the quote-unquote great drought, it rocks the southwest pretty hard. But there should have been enough food stored up, right? Those great house palaces aren't just for living in, remember? They were also used to store up the people's excess corn. And those great house palaces have spread to encompass the entire land by now. At least for the first part of the drought, there certainly would have been enough corn saved up in those great house palaces. But even beyond saving up, Plog points out Carla Van West's research, which states that even during this drought, there was, quote, enough productive agricultural land to support all of the people living in the northern San Juan, end quote. But again, the moves and the changes, they began before this drought takes hold. No new building occurs in the area starting in the year 1277, only one year after the drought began. Certainly, they wouldn't have known it was going to last another 25 years. So as Plog points out, the drought was probably the straw that broke the camel's back. One of the final contributing factors. It only took one year of the rains not falling as they had, had been falling for hundreds of years by this point. And then there was that probably rocky year after the volcano. Maybe those things combined to make an already unstable situation break out into that post-Chaco Civil War, and then the further violence before everyone just left. I heard and read throughout college and in many of my readings for this series that it simply just was the climate. The climate forced the Anasazi to move. The climate forced the Anasazi to break out into bad violence. But I think that's projecting our own current narrative bias on the past. People don't always dictate their entire lives' decisions on the climate. If that were the case, people wouldn't live on riverbanks because of floods. I wouldn't have moved to Southern California because of the current drought. And an ex-U.S. president wouldn't have bought two properties mere feet from the ocean which he claims is going to drown us all. Plog puts it well when he says, quote, 
It is thus an oversimplification to see climatic change as the primary cause of the abandonment. Such views treat culture change as little more than an automatic human response to environmental stimuli, without recognizing that the people themselves are the central players. End quote. Plog also goes on to say something that I hinted at previously when he mentions that the people may have forced their own removal from the land. And they could have done this by over-farming or, more likely, deforestation. This large boom in population, along with the increase in structures and the added fuels for fire, it would have decimated the already precarious southwestern groves of trees. Analyzed wood charcoal from the area of Chaco Canyon in the Membres Valley, they suggest the people went from the superior pinon and juniper to the inferior for fires, ponderosa pine, and cottonwood. Not because they wanted to, but because it was all the wood that was left. The decreased trees means decreased animals. These animals that depend on the trees, which means decreased food for the people. Also, the erosion that the deforestation would have caused would have been detrimental in many cases. And remember when I mentioned those San Juan red wares? Those ceramic pots that were all the rage? The new innovation of the Anasazi? Well, again, that form of creating that red ware pottery used a whole lot more oxygen, which would have required a whole lot more trees as the oxygen would have made the fires hotter and burn faster. Not to mention the amount of construction in the southwest at this time is astounding. All of this could have influenced the area's environment and led to a rapid desertification, especially coupled with the Great Drought of 1277. Besides not knowing the full answer on why the Ancient Ones left, the question of if they had to leave at all is brought up by Lexan when he tells David Roberts in Lost World, quote, Here's the kicker. Our most advanced environmental modeling shows us that they didn't have to leave at all. Even the worst periods of the Great Drought could have supported numbers of people, and they could have shifted gears and built canals. The Hohokam had been doing just that for a thousand years, and the Membres for several centuries. When the last villagers left the Mesa Verde area, sometime after 1280, the homelands were truly empty. If anyone stayed behind... We can't find them archaeologically. The totality and finality of the evacuations suggest to me political rather than environmental processes. Complete depopulation is unusual in history. When it happens, it often follows immense natural calamities, disasters of biblical proportions, not just a drought. Great, but no worse than several the Anasazi had previously weathered. The disaster that ended Chaco and Aztec was, at least in part, and, I think largely, man-made. Failure of the political system. So to piggyback off of Lexan, a more important landscape for explaining why the people left their homes and homeland is the social, cultural, and political landscape, which are all a whole lot harder for us and archaeologists and researchers to know since those rarely get preserved especially in societies which do not have a written language, or at least didn't leave a record of one. What we do know is that after centuries of toying around on the Chaco Meridian, the Ancient Ones adopted a southern lifestyle and changed their entire society. They came together from all over the Four Corners, and they built Chaco Canyon. They built the Great House Outliers. They built the Pueblos and the multifamily structures that abound in the area. There are countless of these homes and great houses all over the landscape, and we've talked all about them, but it's easy to understate just really how many there actually are. But this new southern-influenced society created their secondary state that looks a lot like a southern people's Nahual Altapetl, and this Nahual Altapetl governed the Anasazi and kept the peace through state-sanctioned violence and force, and probably Maybe some sort of southern-style quote-unquote religion. Maybe. This southern religion probably eclipsed what the archaic Anasazi had previously been doing, 
which you can see a glimpse of with the petroglyphs and, and pictographs. And I, I think it eclipsed it because once Chaco Canyon gets established and becomes the, the major monumental polity that it becomes in the Southwest, those that kind of rock art and petroglyphs and pictographs that the, the archaic ones were doing, the basket makers were doing, it disappears. Uh, the level of artistry, it goes down. And those images kind of fade away, at least, you know, possibly until after the Civil War and the migration when the Kachina culture comes back. Well, maybe not comes back, but begins. And then these rotating prince rulers, the Altipedal, with their matrilineal heritage, got along in Chaco. And then they moved to Aztec. And Aztec wasn't anything to balk at. Aztec was a recreation of Chaco down to the brick. As Lexan puts it, quote, Aztec must have been the largest ancestral Puebloan center in the southwest for about 175 years, from A.D. 1125 to 1300, smaller by one order of magnitude than Chaco, end quote. But then in the 1200s, something split the Anasazi, Chaco, and Aztec polity apart, violently, and real migration, separation, and change began. The Anasazi Civil War, or Revolution, it had begun, and it would engulf the area, the entire area, until 1300. Lexan calls that date, 1300, a great divide, and says, quote, Almost every aspect of iconography, pottery, rock art, murals, everything, changed dramatically. We don't know the details. We can never know the details. But from its material expression, it seems clear that religion changed. It's not obscure or subtle. Every Southwest archaeologist who is paying attention knows of this, as do most interested laymen. He goes on to say, There is abundant evidence for change in cosmology and religion, and to me, very clear evidence of political collapse. End quote. It looks like, to me at least, that the Civil War had been decided by this point, before 1300. And the winner was able to dictate the future of the Anasazi. And that future included packing everything and everyone up, well, not everything, but packing everyone up and moving down south. Maybe where that ruler or group of rulers who won the Civil War were from to begin with. I think it's entirely possible and feasible that the home team of Mesa Verde Anasazi, who had come down to Chaco to create something new, with the Mesoamerican newcomers who had come up to Chaco. Well, to me, it's possible those Mesa Verde Anasazi eventually lost the war. Maybe they were killed. Maybe they were eaten. Maybe they were exiled to the Rio Grande Pueblos or even further away. Well, a whole bunch of survivors definitely went to the Rio Grande Pueblos. But maybe many were killed. Or maybe they became slaves to the Southerners and or, were forced to, at spear point to walk down the Chaco Meridian all the way to Pakime. Maybe that's why everything changed. The Mesa Verde Anasazi rulers lost, and with it, they lost the right to practice their religion, display their art, make their type of pottery. They lost the right to influence their region, and they lost the right to live as free people, maybe. So, faced with that future, they left. Or maybe the Mesa Verde people won and kicked out the Anasazi, who then headed south. And those Anasazi would absorb or get rid of everyone they came in contact with, like the Mogollon and the Hohoka, which we will discuss next time. Maybe the Mesa Verde were triumphant, but felt the area of the Four Corners and the Anasazi homeland was too marred in a history of violence and man corn and terrible mistakes. So maybe they made their way east to the Rio Grande Pueblos, which they knew were already there. They certainly would have known about those Pueblo peoples and the land that they inherited probably had been influencing them as well, but they were able to avoid Chaco's fate. Shortly after the Civil War was decided, the ones who remained in the area began practicing their new Kachina culture religion, which spread from the Hopi in Arizona to the Rio Grande Pueblos near Santa Fe. But we'll talk about that later also. That religious split could have been one of the key reasons the war began in the first place. 
or it could have just been one of the many reasons it got so violent. Or it may have made no difference at all. In the end, it doesn't matter who won or lost, because they both left. Maybe they reached an understanding or a truce, and they both decided to vacate the area with the Anasazi going south with their religion and their T-shaped doors and their kivas and their pottery, which was now influenced by the Mesa Verde pottery. And maybe the ancestral Pueblo and Mesa Verde group Maybe they went east with their newly formed or forming Kachina way of life. Proto-Kachina, we'll call it. And they had their ceremony of forgetting. As Lexan says, Despite all of this evidence for migration and destruction and abandonment, all that's left in the archaeological record, we can never know the full details. I know that isn't a satisfying conclusion, but it's the best one I got. We will never know. But we're not done quite yet. Whatever the reason, though, the place, the four corners, the place was abandoned. And, you know, I'm not really bothered that a 2012 textbook said that the word abandoned is offensive. They claim it's better to use depopulated, which, uh, it means the same thing. Even Plog has a section titled Denouement in the Four Corners region, which... I mean, I didn't even have to look up in the dictionary to find what the word denouement means. I can clearly tell it's another fancier term for abandonment. I don't even know if I'm saying it right. Although Plog does use the word abandoned, and so does Lexan and Childs, a couple of them seemed to avoid it. I mean, a lot of articles, especially the more recent ones. And, you know, Barillo does point out that people may have eventually returned, maybe, The area of Bears Ears and Cedar Mesa is littered with buried ceramics and baskets filled with seeds and tools that it is estimated would have been used by returning people decades or centuries later. But because of the Spanish and their arrival, the spiral was interrupted. The Four Corners was indeed abandoned by the Anasazi for good. They may have abandoned the area, but they didn't vanish off the face of the earth like those... Dolphins and a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. But they vacated the American Southwest. Plog puts it succinctly when he says, quote, The abandonments of many settlements and entire regions were not partial, but complete. He goes on to say, It was inconceivable for some people to leave and others to stay. End quote. In some instances, It may have been crucial for an entire group to leave, because each member of that group could have been an important part of the cosmological glue that kept this world, the Anasazi world, together. Plog again. Most native societies of the New World believe today, and almost certainly believed in the past, that there is no separation between culture and nature, and that the actions of their political or religious leaders can affect rainfall, agricultural yields, and virtually any other aspect of their lives, end quote. Of course, you've got to be careful projecting modern beliefs onto the past. But in this case, he could be onto something. Speaking of not projecting modern Puebloan beliefs onto the Anasazi, I'm going to do it again, real quick, sort of. What I'm about to discuss is both a history and a belief system of modern peoples that live in the American Southwest. And this history and belief system applies very much to our story. While it is true that the Anasazi completely and totally abdicate from the areas we've been discussing so heavily, the Four Corners region and the Southwest, That area wasn't itself totally depopulated. As the ancient ones left for the south, or possibly even before, newcomers to the area filled in the spaces that the Anasazi had lived. Those people are the Navajo. In the past few months, I've read that some Navajo traditions have them coming up from the ground, emerging from a hole, and that the Navajo have always been on these red lands that they inhabit now. I've also read that they were latecomers to the area from the way up north. And a few of their own oral traditions support this as well. Also, their language is found in northern Canada. 
Barillo says this of the Navajo, quote, The Dine and Apache tribes living in the southwest today speak languages that are part of the Athabascan language group, which appears to be historically centered in western Canada. Some of the dialects spoken by indigenous groups still living in the icy white north retain enough linguistic overlap with Dine that conversation between them is still possible. End quote. When in college, I learned that they arrived mere moments before the Spanish. And to back that view up, Plog states that, quote, Important though they may have been to the life of the region in historic times, they played no part in the story of the ancient Southwest. End quote. They being the Navajo. And I'm not totally sure of, of that statement anymore. But I'm also not totally convinced it's wrong either. Lexon says of the year 1300 that the Navajo people, quote, became the sole proprietors and custodians of the old Chacoan polity. Navajo people live in and among its ruins and have names and stories for many key features, natural or built. Those stories are often quite specific, end quote. In the last episode, I mentioned how the Navajo say there was a king at Chaco who made everyone their slave. While they could have heard that from Pueblo peoples who fled around 1300, they could have also witnessed it themselves. But uh, you got to stay with me because I'm going to jump around just a little bit. And I know we're not even talking about the Anasazi anymore. But the Navajo are important to our story right now to understand what happened to the Anasazi and why they left, and why they left such a trail of destruction when they did. But fear not, next year, or in the future, I will do a series on the Navajo. They're just such an important group of people to the Southwest, uh, historically and today, and possibly prehistorically too. That series will no doubt start around this time when they arrive in the Southwest, and will go to the World War II code talkers. But all right. Let's get back to the Anasazi. To the modern-day Akama, Zia, and several other Kiras Pueblos, the traditional history of what's known as White House is a powerful story. The White House was a quote-unquote notable place to the north where wonderful and terrible things happened. Lexen says some Native American groups and researchers suggest White House was Mesa Verde while he thinks it's Chaco Canyon. But, honestly, it may refer to the entire Chaco Aztec region of the Four Corners in general, including Mesa Verde. Lexen quotes from these uh, traditions uh, when he explains that when the people left this White House of the North, searching for their center place, uh, which is a place, or was, a place not ruled by the Anasazi, as the people left the White House, they stopped to perform a ceremony of forgetting, where they left their sickness and troubles behind. That sickness and trouble, no doubt, contained the human sacrifice and violence of Chaco Canyon that occurred. I mean, you can't forget the ceremonial heart-carving knife that was found in Chaco Canyon. Plus, all of the fire, all of the destruction, and all of the bones. After Chaco... The region was abandoned starting in 1300, which we've talked about. Very few, if any at all, since 1300, very few modern Puebloan peoples have come back to visit the sites that were once so very important, like Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon. But to the Akama, the White House was a place where people got power over people. And the peoples, as Lexon put it, quote, lived lives and created societies incorrect or inappropriate for Pueblo philosophers today. Men who embraced social, political, religious hierarchy and envisioned control and power over places, resources, and people. End quote. In his retelling of the White House, he is quoting Rena Switzel's A Pueblo Woman's Perspective on Chaco Canyon from the 2004 In Search of Chaco. So, he is quoting... Um, Puebloan people, because some of this information is privileged to modern Puebloan people, and uh, I don't want you to think I'm stealing knowledge or exploiting it. It is published. More from Lexon, quote, The place, known as White House, was grand and glorious, but became corrupt and ripe for correction. Rather than Old Testament-style destruction, 
the people, following advice from their spiritual councils, voted with their feet, left rulers and bad guys behind, and moved on to newer places and better behaviors. They rejected the hierarchical social structures of White House and reinvented themselves as Pueblos, end quote, meaning today's Puebloan people. This reinvention occurred after that aforementioned ceremony of forgetting, which occurred after they left the White House, or Chacoan area, which events, to quote Lexon, were never forgotten. But the ceremony of forgetting probably ensured that the full story is remembered and recounted only when needed in the present. The bad example with which to correct improper behaviors. End quote. So, the Pueblo peoples who voted with their feet could have told the Navajo about the evil Chacoan government. That evil Chacoan government they were actively choosing to never replicate again. But, that would suggest the ceremony of forgetting that they performed on their way out wasn't the most successful. Instead, the Navajos may have been witness to the entire Chacoan fall themselves. Lexen says, quote, Pueblo people's traditional histories of Chaco and the lessons and principles learned there are central to their heritage, but not perhaps the details. Navajo people know and share details. Navajo people live on that landscape and encounter the ruins every day, constantly refreshing memories through daily life. End quote. So, what did the Navajos say of the White House area, that is, the Four Corners region, of Chaco and Aztec and Mesa Verde and all the rest? Again from Lexan, quote, A central oppressive ruler, the winner of people, who was not a local, neither Pueblo nor Navajo, enslaved everyone, both Pueblo and Navajo, and demanded that they build him a magnificent house, Pueblo Alto, and houses for his cronies and kin, the other great houses. After a period of oppressive rule, the people rose up in revolt and dispatched him, either by death or by shooting him straight up to the skies or straight south back to Mexico, where he came from. End quote. And I do apologize if I butchered Nahuitmigi, the winner of people. I don't know. I don't speak Navajo, and it's a very difficult language. So I apologize to all the Navajo brothers and sisters listening. Please forget me. Maybe by the Navajo series next year, I will have a better understanding of the language, but probably not. So the Navajo and the Anasazi combined together, according to the Navajo, and overthrew the king, sending him back to Mexico from whence he came. Christy Turner, who wrote Mancorn, and I have quoted quite a bit, and Lexan, and me, and others, believe without a doubt that Chaco's start was spurned by Southerners from Mexico. I know I've mentioned it before, but I'll quote Turner, who states the theory quite well. In an article titled Cannibals of the Canyon for the New Yorker in 1998, Author Douglas Preston wrote of Turner and the Southerner Migrants Theory. Quote, Turner directed his attention to central Mexico, to the empire of the Toltecs, the precursors to the Aztecs, which lasted from about 800 to 1100 AD. Central Mexico, he writes, developed a very powerful dehumanizing sociopolitical and ideological complex centered on human sacrificing cannibalism used as a form of social control. Furthermore, cannibalism spread from central Mexico into the jungle world of the Mayas and the desert world of Chichimeca in northern Mexico. Turner concludes, It takes nearly blind faith in the effectiveness of geographical distance to believe that this complex and its adherents failed to reach the American Southwest. During the Toltec period, Turner hypothesizes a heavily armed group of thugs, tinkers, or perhaps even Manson party types, as he put it to me in various conversations, headed north to the region we refer to as the American Southwest. They entered the San Juan Basin around 8900, he surmises in Mancorn, and found a suspicious but pliant population whom they terrorized into reproducing the theocratic lifestyle they had previously known in Mesoamerica. In other words, the flowering of Chaco society that we have so long admired in engineering, astronomy, architecture, art, and culture 
was the product of a small, heavily armed gang from Mexico who marched into the Southwest to conquer and brutalize. End quote. Preston later says, quote, Turner writes in Mancorn that Mexicans did in fact make the journey northward. He notes that a school found in Chaco Canyon had intentionally chipped teeth, a decorative trait thought to be restricted almost entirely to central Mexico. End quote. So maybe the Navajos are right, and they teamed up with the Mesa Verde Ancestral Puebloans and won the Civil War and kicked out those hungry Southerners back down to Mexico. It's also possible that the Navajo and Ancestral Puebloans who left the spiral were actually the losers. Or maybe they made the area untenable for the Anasazi to stay in. This would also help answer why, when the Spanish arrived in the Southwest, they saw no kings. Because modern Puebloan people got rid of them, scraped them from the bottom of their sandal, as Lexan put it. They were a free, or freer, people. Something very similar happened to the Maya, who threw off their rulers and just walked back into the jungle, later forgetting the temples were even there. And also the Mississippians, at almost the exact same time as well. Later, Native Americans who were kidnapped and taken to France and then returned back to the United States, uh, especially, in particular, one man named Candiaronk, Kendiaronk would later tell missionaries that they did not understand, they being the Native Americans, but Kendiaronk did not understand why the French people put up with the king. Because his people, the Indians, long ago had disposed of their king and vowed to never return to a time of being ruled again. Now, he was talking about the Mississippian, but he could have just as easily been describing the Southwest. Incredibly, these... Anti-ruler enlightenment words from Kendiaronk were written down by these French Catholic missionaries, along with a whole bunch of other unheard of ideas like freedom of assembly and freedom of religion and many other awesome ideas central to us in the Enlightenment now. These prints, these copies of these books, were obviously banned in France and many other countries, but somehow, some got around and even ended up across the channel in England. Those ideas in the early 1700s were talked about and expounded upon in coffee houses and taverns and eventually made it back across the pond to where they originated and where they were incorporated heavily into our founding fathers' ideas, which means these fundamental Western ideas like democracy and freedom, uh, lack of monarchy, no dictator, etc., that we think of as being from like Rome and like Greece, which, I mean, if you know your Greek and Roman history, that's absurd. But these ideas, these American ideas that we have in our constitution, they actually sprang forth in the new world by an entire continent of people, except maybe the Pacific Northwest and a few other holdouts. But these ideas partially originated in the new world by themselves, by a people who were living here and who were generally free and carefree. An entire continent of free people. R read any account of Europeans that were taken by and adopted into Native American tribes, and you'll see the same theme over and over again. They live after the fear wears off. They live in absolute and near-complete freedom. Those who weren't enslaved, let's be honest. But they live in absolute and near-complete freedom and a lack of desire to return to the white man's world when they are rescued. And the Native Americans, the ones that would try to uh, assimilate into American culture, a lot of them gave up because it was not free. American culture was not freedom. American culture could be argued today to still not be freedom, although a lot more free than many other places. I'm sorry, got a little off topic there. One of the most amazing books I've ever read, called The Dawn of Everything, talks about, about this, Candy Aronk and these ideas and the Enlightenment, and it blew me away. But modern Pueblo societies also overthrew their leaders at Chaco and Aztec, and they also remade their society in much the same way. A free way. Modern Pueblo peoples, cultures, and ways of life are a reaction against Chacoan political systems, not a development from them, as Lexan puts it. 
We will never know exactly what happened to the Anasazi and ancestral Puebloans during their civil war or revolution before the abandonment. We will never know if the Navajo aided them in their plight, the Mesa Verdeans, against the Southerners. But we do know that what happened was shocking. What happened was shocking, and it was violent, and it was system-ending. Neither side of the Civil War looked the same after it was over. Sure, both sides retained a lot of Chaco and grandeur, but both sides diverged and would change. We know the Anasazi head south and absorb both Mogollon and Hohokam aspects as they head down to Mexico to disappear for real. Maybe disappear for real. We'll see about that. And we do know the ancestral Puebloans either stick to their mesa tops on the New Mexican-Arizona border, or they head to the east into the Rio Grande Pueblos, where they uh, attempt to remake themselves. But in that period of remaking themselves over the course of the next couple hundred years, the modern Puebloans not only forgot how to make the black on white, that all-important ancestral Puebloan Anasazi black on white pottery and its sister iterations, but they also forget how to flint nap arrowheads anywhere near as good as their ancestors had. To this day, the modern Puebloans cannot recreate the Anasazi pottery. Now, that may be a purposeful decision to, to forget and leave those behind, since ceramics did come north with cannibalism, but they do continue ceramics. We, we just can't know for sure. <laughs> While we do know the modern Puebloan peoples and others are descendants of the ancient ones that inhabited uh, those mesa tops and canyon wall alcoves and caves and great houses, we cannot always rely on their oral traditions. As one old-timer archaeologist put it to Roberts, quote, the Hopi oral traditions aren't worth the paper they're printed on, end quote. While I think that's a bit harsh, it does hint at some truth. Remember, there were multiple world-shattering events for these ancestral Puebloans, from the Anasazi Civil War that we've just discussed, to the arrival of the Spanish with their diseases and their savior, all the way up to the Americans. All of these events and a whole lot more, but all these events would have profoundly disrupted and altered these people's way of life, culture, and how they viewed their history. At the same time, the modern-day Puebloans' ancestors were finding their center place as they left the Chacoan lands after that brutal civil war. At the same time as they were forgetting how to fire the pottery and chip away at minerals to make arrowheads and spear points, at least nearly anywhere as well as their ancestors had. At the same time, they were adopting the ceremony of forgetting and creating the Kachina culture for centuries. The modern Puebloans' ancestors lived in a world in the southwest with much more violence than there had been during the heyday of Chaco. The Civil War's lasting effects took half a millennia to wear off. This would have also deeply affected how the ancestral Puebloans viewed their world and their past, and how they see it today. It would have altered their oral traditions. After the ancestral Puebloans were left to inherit what was left of the southwest, the ancestral Puebloans built defensive structures, they battled, they warred, they adopted beleaguered tribes and clans as either refugees or sometimes as more fighters. They escorted many captives off their Pueblo's front porch, aka the sheer side of a mesa wall, and the ancestral Puebloans, they even wiped out entire villages of men, women, and children that stood in their way on their journey to their center place. The later-to-arrive Spanish would write about these events that the ancestral Puebloans were doing, and would write about their fighting prowess, and about how their Puebloan communities were an effective impediment to siege and battling. The ancestral, I guess now Puebloan peoples, were quite practiced in the arts of defense and warfare, which we will get into next time. Don't fall for that Pueblo mystique. But, at the same time, don't be insensitive to living people's histories. It's a fine line to carefully walk across. But for me, I'm interested in the truth, the truth of what happened, or as close to the truth as we'll find. And I'm really, I'm not afraid to say it like it is, or like how I see it. <laughs>
Okay, I'm a little afraid. After David Roberts published his book, In Search of the Old Ones, in 1996, he was barred from entering national parks. Barred. He wasn't even offered permits on BLM land. Rangers and staff hated him, and they would scoff at him, and they would deny his requests and ticket him. He had to go to the freaking capital of the United States and talk with lizard, I mean, he had to talk with politicians about being allowed back onto public lands, all because of a book. Some academics reviled him. Other writers, besides David Roberts, but they are hated by Puebloans today for talking about their history in a light they don't like. And they're barred from entering their sovereign lands, the Puebloans' sovereign lands. There are real-life consequences to innocent words, sometimes. In a world where you can be sued a billion dollars for talking into a microphone, I am a little afraid. I don't want to piss off the wrong people. But I do want to search for and to tell y'all the best history and story that I can. As Childs puts it, the archaeological evidence of the Southwest paints the picture of an extremely densely populated area where it would have been impossible to avoid encountering another person every half hour. Yet, by the early 1300s, one could have walked for hundreds of miles before seeing another living soul. We will never know the exact reason why the Chaco and Aztec polity, the Anasazi, began to tear themselves apart, literally and figuratively. But by 1300, the dominoes had fallen, the kivas were burned, and the pueblos were surrounded by ritually smashed pottery as the people, sometimes rather quickly, left the four corners. I say sometimes quickly because at some locations, at some ruins, tools, food, and heavy objects were left behind in the middle of being used. Corn cobs, that almighty token of Anasazi, I mean the symbol of Anasazi, corn. Corn cobs have been found to be only half crushed in matates with the mono resting nearby. The spiral was beginning to turn into itself, it seems. By that year of 1300, there are not enough human beings remaining to have left an archaeological impact in the southern Colorado, in the Bears Ears, or in the Cedar Mesa region. The four corners were essentially empty. On the periphery of the old Chacoan world is where the people that stayed would settle into. Areas like Black Mesa of Arizona, where the ancestral Hopis lived, West Central New Mexico, where the ancient Zuni resided, sections of the Little Colorado River, the Mogollon Rim, uh, the Salt and Gila River basins, northern Mexico, the Rio Grande Valley, and Antelope Mesa in Arizona. We will return to all of those places and the people who stayed in and around them in the American Southwest, um, but those people who had left the Chacoan world of the Four Corners and, and stayed around. But first, before we talk about them, especially those Rio Grande people, we're going to follow the faction of Anasazi, those Southerners, that headed south into the mountains of northern Mexico. And as they did, they ran into all of their neighbors that we've talked about. But from here on out, we're walking. So get your sandals, not on, but ready. Do some stretching, because we've got 400 miles of deserts and mountains to cross. You know, those crows. I was not going to end the, the series, or I guess this episode right here, because I'm really only halfway through what I thought was going to be this final episode before we get to 1680. But really, I mean, there's so much more movement. There's so much more migration and following of that spiral as they head down south. I mean, we still got to walk through the Mogollon Rim. They still interact with the Hohokam. They change both societies forever. So we've got a lot of talking and a lot of walking to do before we follow those Anasazi and their trail of destruction and abandonment all the way into the high cliffs of the Sierra Madres. That's where their trail will finally grow cold. And that's where the Spanish will stumble upon their T-shaped doors and their 
supposed army of tens of thousands of Anasazi soldiers 